an evil Batman has traveled through the dark multiverse, conquering everything and defeating our heroes. This is Death Metal, the full story. And this is on the Comic Story and Channel, where we take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and we break them down into digestible bites to help you understand. Then we read them dramatically back to you. All alterations of the panel, text, and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. Today we're going to be bringing you the story of Death Metal in our full story format. This story took literally about a year to come to its conclusion, so these videos are panned over the course of a year. But we managed to get a bunch of the important tie-ins and the important story elements and combine them all into one giant video for you. I hope you guys enjoy the battle for the end of the multiverse, the end of everything. A rumble in the dark and the light clicks on. Sergeant Rock stands there, smoking a pack of cigarettes, smiling. Well, look who it is. I told him you'd show up. Someone tells him to hurry up, but he yells, You gotta be quiet! He lets the person know that the battle is raging, that they've got a real turd burger topside. Another blast. It's like you're on a drive through and out comes a juicy half-pounder with curly fries, and you bite into it, BAM! Turd! And your fries, kablam! Curly turds! He tells him, but Rock smiles, telling the person to take that burger and shove it down the waiter's throat. Cause we're still fighting back, he tells them, holding up a massive rifle. And we're gonna have some fun doing it. Oorah! In the realm of the DCU, Wonder Woman lowers her whirling chainsaw, sparks flying, reflecting, and illuminating her wielder's goggles. A voice calls out, gaining her attention. I bring news. Swamp Thing tells her, his body smoking and smoldering. Well, good or bad, she asks, pulling down the goggles and staring at her friend. Alec looks at her, telling her, He's bringing a prisoner. Huh, I didn't know there were any villains left in the world above to in prison here, Diana notes, but Swamp Thing stares solemnly up at the ceiling. Oh, I can think of a few hundred at least. Pointy ears, bats on their chest. He tells his friend. Wonder Woman asks who are they bringing, but Alec isn't sure. It's someone important. He has muscle with him. I sense three bats, he tells her. Diana is shocked at who could warrant such a guard. They walk out of the chamber, leaving her chainsaw idle and the invisible jet waiting quietly. Donning her full regalia, Wonder Woman walks through the prison, bringing cries of freedom from the villains in prison there. Even the Joker leans out of his cell with bat-shaped sunglasses on his face. Psst, Wonder Woman, I think you're doing a bang-up job. He smiles at her. Alec pulls out the vines, grasping the glasses, ripping them off his face. Joker, where did you get these? You know that the symbol is forbidden to all except his dark knights. If they catch you, they'll throw you in the pits. He snaps angrily, but Joker begins to cackle. <laughs> Go ahead. The world up there is ruled by Batman. Down here is paradise to me. He laughs. Arriving at the entrance hall, Diana is greeting the three Batmen that stand waiting. Bat Mage holds up the chain to their cloaked and hooded prisoner, while the others wait quietly. Diana, you're late, Bat Mage notes. Diana nods, telling them that she would never receive them without her full regalia. She tells the mage that they are running out of cells, asking where he expects her to put this one. Oh, this one isn't going in the cell. Open the pits directly, Bat Mage tells her. The pits? Who the hell are you asking me to lock up? She asks. Bat Rex steps forward a massive T-Rex that shares Batman's color scheme. Do as you're told, or it'll be your sister screaming in the pits. He roars at her, but the beast does not frighten Diana. Speak of my sisters again, reptile, she warns. Bat Rex huffs, telling her that he is Batman, and she nods, knowing the story of how in his world, Batman uploaded his consciousness to the robot dinosaur in the Bat Cave. Can you throw batarangs with those tiny little arms? She asks. Bat Rex pauses for a moment. They're proportional and I'm working on it, he tells her. Alec finally steps forward, calming everyone, and Diana finally opens up the pits, allowing the prisoner to enter. That mage nods, telling her that their lord has called for a meeting at Castle Bat, and she is to attend. As the prisoner passes her, he looks up from the hood. Diana, remember, he whispers, and her eyes go wide with shock as she steps forward, but Bat Mage is there telling her that they don't want to be late for their master. Castle Bat, located on the site of an ancient park. Bruce remembers when his father would bring him there as a child. It's a place where the colonists of Gotham fought against the British. They called themselves the Deadbeats, and they were all killed for their crimes. The Robins all look down with their twisted smiles from their perches, sharp teeth and hungry eyes glowing in the night. 
Overhead, Joker dragons are swooping and diving into the red-hued night air. And the Batman who laughs looks at all of those that have gathered, knowing that they are sick of him. But he laughs, as they know that if they didn't arrive, he would kill them all. Tell me, have there been any captures in your territories? He asks. First, he turns to Harley Quinn, hunter of the wastelands, accompanied by Dr. Arkham and her hyenas and giant bats. Yet she shakes her head. Aquaman, commander of the Black Fleet. And Aquaman tells him nay. He turns to Diana and Batmage, informing the warden that the new prisoner is not to be messed with. Understood, Diana nods. He turns the last to Mr. Miracle, clad in chains that even he can't break free of. Superman has almost succumbed to the anti-life equation, Miracle notes, with an image of the Man of Steel appearing before them. Batman Who Laughs congratulates his Justice League in a job well done, informing them that Perpetua has destroyed another world, killing off Earth-22. Only eight of the multiverses remain. As Batman continues his speech, Diana suddenly hears a voice in her head, the voice of the one true Batman. Diana, can you hear me? He asks. She questions how he's able to do this and Batman tells her, I made my own version of Jean's telepathic link years ago. I know that you just melted down your invisible jet, that you want to use it to create armor that will hide us. We can use that to infiltrate the castle. Use the Batman who laughs tech to hide a world from Perpetua, Batman tells her. But Diana doesn't know. She believes that they should just fight back to get all of the worlds back. And Batman's voice is still in her mind, telling her that the need to save whoever's left, that's all they can do. Lost in the thought! The Batman who laughs suddenly asks her, bringing her back to the group, and he smiles, telling her, In some worlds, you and Bruce are lovers. I truly know you better than your own Bruce ever did. I'll only ask you once. What secrets are you hiding? He asks her with a broad smile, but she stares at him angrily, telling him that he knows nothing of her. The Batman who laughs nods, circling her, telling her, I can take away your friends, burn the last of the parliament of trees. Diana, don't let him! Alec groans, still smoldering and smoking. Suddenly, an arrow is launched out of the trees, and the robins leap in front of their master, taking the explosion to no effect. Bruce, is that to you? Let me guess, you're wearing the cloak of erasure, given to us by Zatanna the time that we saved her father from Neuron. Come on, I know you! The Batman who laughs calls, smiling, and Batman removes the cloak from the tree line, clad in a leather trench coat and carrying a crossbow. Nice coat! You look like someone who came to dance in my grave! Lucky for me, you don't kill! <laughs> Batman's eyes narrow. I don't dance either, but I'd make an exception for you. The Batman who laughs cackles, ordering his men to kill Batman. His Justice League moves forward as more Batman pour out of a portal. Diana tries to help her friend, but Batmage uses his powers to stop her. Bathomet wraps his tentacles around Aquaman, and the giant bats herd Harley before she can help. Yet, through it all, Batman doesn't move. Just standing there, not fighting back! The one who laughs asks, What would the brave men and women who died say? Batman holds up his hand, revealing the black lantern ring on his finger. Just one thing, rise! He growls, and all around him, the deadbeats begin to crawl out of the ground. They pull free, turning their rotting heads to stare at their new master. And Batman points at the Batman who laughs, ordering them to attack. The zombies clash with the Dark Knights, fighting in the field. Batman turns to escape, thinking to Diana that this is how they need to fight. Street battles, small victories, but Diana tells him of a new prisoner and how they can fix everything. Don't even think that way. It's too dangerous, too many deaths, he tells her. He hops aboard his bat by turning to the man holding it. Hex, they're all yours, he tells the cowboy. Finally, a party where I'm the pretty one. Hex whispers, joining the fight. On the bone planet of Ossex, a lone figure walks through the marrow waste when he finally stops swinging his axe hard, breaking through the bone, and he discovers a box, wiping away the dust from the cigar in his hand. Did you find it? It's the key to everything. Talk to me. A voice calls over the radio, and Lobo stands up smiling. Oh, I found it. And now it's time for the main man to live up to this joint. At her prison, Diana sits before the entrance to the pit, gazing into the green smoke of the entrance. Finally, she stands up, making up her mind. She opens the gate, beginning to step through, and Alex steps forward, warning her that the Batman who laughs might sense this. I'm not powerful enough to fight beside you anymore. He warns her, and Diana nods, speaking over her shoulder to her old friend. Alec, you should run now. I can't take this darkness anymore, and I can't fight the way that Bruce wants. This has to be a way to turn it all back. She tells him, but Alec doesn't leave. I will be here, ready to fight beside you as best as I can. He tells her. She thanks him and disappears, and in the pit, she finds the hooded figure sitting quietly in the waist. 
I was expecting fire and brimstone. I forgot that the ninth level is a cold wasteland, he tells her, his breath steaming in the frigid air. Is it really you, Wally West? She asks, and Wally pulls down his hood, revealing his blue costume and the Dr. Manhattan symbol on his forehead. It's me, or what's left of me, he tells her. Wally stands and Diana asks what happened. She doesn't remember how they got her, just that they fought Perpetua and the next thing that Diana knew, Batman were ruling the earth. If I could erase everything that I've done, I would, Diana. I'm so tired, he tells her. Diana nods, holding her friend, telling him to take this moment and rest. They sit and Wally explains the multiverse to Diana. He tells her that there are two poles. For every positive energy in the multiverse, there is a negative. I have come to call it crisis energy, he tells her. Beings like Perpetua are tasked with creating multiverses. They create these worlds and they die, yet Perpetua created their multiverse using the crisis energy, one that would forever live in a self-renewing loop of its own importance. A multiverse that would prey on others, absorb them and forget them. Her kind found out what she had done and they began our reality over, trapping her in the source wall and the hopes that by watching our grow, she would come to love us, he explains. Yet only her rage grew. She began to whisper to those that she could, stroking their greed and anger, instigating crises. He tells her that a being known as Dr. Manhattan arrived and tried to fix their world, but it didn't have the desired effect. So the quintessence gathered the energy and gave it to the Justice League. But Perpetua harnessed the crisis energy and they fought. I don't know what happened in that fight, only that it exhausted both forces in a powerful blast that burned away the sun. Diana questions why Perpetua will remain so powerful, and Wally tells her that the Batman Who Laughs continues to provide her energy from the dark multiverse, where the crises have endlessly happened. Maybe we can beat her at her own game, Diana suggests. Create the first anti-crisis. And the Batman Who Laughs growls from the darkness and steps out. <laughs> I love that idea. If you were really smart, you'd call the two energies anti-crisis and direct crises. Get it? AC and DC. But go on, please, pretend I'm not here. She steps between the Batman who laughs and Wally, ordering the demon to stay back. She knows that he won't kill her friends, that he won't have any way to feed Perpetua the crisis energies. And he smiles, telling her, Oh, I have my own plans. Right now my knights have Swamp Thing at their mercy. You help me, you play your part, and on the other side I will honor our promise. I will give you and all the people that Perpetua holds captive a planet of your own. You will be safe, you have my word. He tells her stepping forward, but fight me and I will hurt your friends in ways that you can't even imagine. He smiles, seeing what she is thinking, and he tells her, you can't outthink me. Let me guess your strategy. Knock me out, dip your armor in the cauldron where the invisible jet was melted down, and suddenly you have a shield to hide behind. He tells her, his grin growing wider, but Diana shakes her head, telling him that he knows Bruce, and Bruce would have made a shield. So what, you make a weapon? A sword? No. I have already made it, and it wouldn't have just been a sword. She tells him, pulling out the starter on an invisible chainsaw, and it roars to life as she lashes out, cutting into the Batman who laughs. Batmage jumps through the portal into Castle Bat, finding the Robins waiting for him, and they crowd around the mage. Yes, he's gone. You were his favorite three, so you should know. It's time to initiate his true plan, Batmage tells them, pressing a smiley face button, opening up a large door in the far end of the room. A being emerges from the blue light within with the symbol of hydrogen on his forehead. Groblins prepare the body of the final Bruce Wayne. Sergeant Rock, meanwhile, is continuing to fire, still rambling about the turd burger. When Batman appears behind him, telling him that the fight is happening now, he picks up the commando, lighter since his body has been ripped in half. The big one! Sergeant Rock asks, one last fight. Everyone, together, Batman growls. The lizard slowly creeps through the tall grass, occasionally peeking its head up and looking around. Finally, it stops, standing up on its hind legs. With a zip, Batum pulls free his disguise and hits his radio. Castle Bat, come in. There's no sign of them yet, but I swear, if they come this way, Batum will teach them that big things come in smooth. He begins, but his words are cut off as a tire runs him over, squashing the tiniest dark knight. The monster Batmobile continues down the road, driving across the hellscape that was once Washington, D.C. Finally, it screeches to a halt inside of an ancient cemetery. Where have you taken me? Hey, you. Fine, you may have severed my brainstem, but I am Batman Beast, the sentient Batmobile tells them. In a world of genius machines, I rose to sentience. You cannot best me. 
As they walk away, a swamp thing looks over his shoulder. If you're smart, why do they call elbows funny bones? He asks, a beep emitting from the hood. The answer is a joke. An elbow is called a funny bone because it's humorous. Batmobiste answers them as the Swamp Thing swings a tentacle from his elbow, smashing into the Dark Knight's face. A Dr. Manhattan-empowered Wally West tries to warn Swamp Thing that he just told a dad joke, but Wonder Woman cuts him off. Enough. We need to find Bruce fast. While the Dark Knights are still reeling from the Batman who laughs at death, she tells them. Alec agrees, but tells her that he doesn't sense Batman in this large cemetery. And Wonder Woman nods, agreeing. That's because he's in the other cemetery, she tells him. Reaching out, she pushes aside one of the gravestones, revealing a stairwell into the darkness below. The group descends the stairs, journeying into this darkness. How do I not know about this? Wally questions. And Diana explains that they are entering the Valhalla Cemetery, the Crypt of Heroes. She explains that it is the resting place of trusted friends and guarded by magic and a rotating group of custodians. I was afraid that when Perpetua rearranged the world for the Batman who laughs, landmarks like this were lost, but it seems like everything is intact. Just twist it around, she tells them. Suddenly, a glowing green three-headed dog rushes around to the corner, barking and growling at Wonder Woman. It tackles her, ignoring her commands to stand down, but Wonder Woman lifts the creature over her head, calling out the guardians of the crypt. Whoever guards the crypt, hear me. Swamp Thing, The Flash, and Wonder Woman are here, and we need your help. Please. The dog stops struggling, and a voice can be heard. What is the password? It asks, and Wonder Woman thinks, finally stating that the last guardian told her that it was Munkle. The guardian suddenly appears, and around the corner, the aging members of the Justice Society of America step into view. It's pronounced Ma Hunkle. She was the guardian of the first headquarters of the Justice Society of America. Alan Scott tells her with a smile. The old heroes greet the group and everyone smiles, shaking hands with those that they have not seen in what seems like forever. Tell me, the world above, can we win it back? Alan asks Diana. That's why we're here, my old friend, she tells him. And behind them, Jay pulls Wally into a hug, telling the young man that he'll never forget him again. Diana asks if Batman is there and Alan nods, telling her that he's asked to not be disturbed. Is conscripting an army, Alan tells her, pointing her into the crypt. Batman stands among the tomb, followed by an undead Jonah Hex, and they move down the line of heroes, with Batman questioning each about their powers. As Jonah rattles off the list of abilities, Batman nods, enlisting those who could be of use with a stamp of his power. Diana comes up behind him, telling Bruce that this isn't the way that they win. But Bruce doesn't answer her right away, pausing. You shouldn't have killed him. Whatever you set in motion, I told you. We needed to fight small, he finally tells her. But that wasn't something that I could live with. I'm sorry, she responds. Bruce sighs, telling her that whatever the Batman who laughs evolves into, they might not be able to stomp it. But he returns to his work, beginning to stamp everyone. We'll take the castle now, fast, forge an attack in the dark. We'll save everyone that we can. No more, no less. She tries to explain to him that they need to get the crisis energy and use it to save all Earths, even those that have fallen. Make something new, beautiful and endless, she tells him, but Bruce turns to her, explaining. We can't do that. Just leave and let me get back to work, he tells her finally, but Diana reaches out, taking his hand before he can stamp another tomb. We're saving everyone, starting with you. She asks him what happened to him in the final battle. What changed inside of him when the Justice League lost? But Bruce pulls his hand away, telling her, it doesn't matter. I know that you're wrong because I've made the same mistakes in the past. When Barbados attacked, I was the one who said we should use the 10th medal. I was the center of the conflict and thought that if we could reach higher, we'd not only win, but make the world a better place. Instead, we broke the source wall. We set Perpetua free. When we reached higher again, we tried to use the energy from Dr. Manhattan to combat her. We fell, and you, you're talking about something crazier, he tells her. No matter how much she tries, Diana cannot get through to Bruce, and she finally turns away with Alex stepping forward. He's scared. Give him some time, Diana. But she looks at her friend, asking what will happen if Bruce is right, and Alec looks back, finally telling her of an ancient fern that he had studied when he was human. He tells her of a prehistoric fern known as a gilboa that grew taller than any tree, and because of its height, other plants grew beneath it, strangling the life out of it. 
Do you agree with Bruce? She asks, but Alex shakes his head. No, because the Gilboa's height quickened the atmosphere's transformation, and now ferns are one of the most prevalent plants alive. My point is reaching for what we may never grasp is never wrong. But the fern, that's the same thing I just told bats, minus the fern, with more swearing. Hex tells him as Batman crosses the room. Bruce, you're in? Just tell me that you have a plan. She nods, telling him that Wally waits in the crypt while they travel to New Apocalypse and rescue their friends. They then travel to the Dark Multiverse, to the original Crisis, and they steal the energy that is being funneled to Perpetua. Use it to finally power up Wally so that he can destroy her and rebuild the universe using the abilities of Dr. Manhattan. Batman nods. Well, that's either a plan or you're having a stroke. Diana nods, telling him that they need to move fast. On it. Hey, bear! Jay Garrick yells. Suddenly, there's a blur of motion and the crackle of lightning. And Barry Allen stands before them. Yeah, what is it? What's wrong? I hope this is worth stopping, Jay. If he detects me. Wally? Barry says quickly, and the three speedsters come together in a triple flash hug, smiling. Jay asks how much speed force is left, with Barry explaining that he has used most of it while trying to go back in time and fix everything. There's no way out of the present he explains. But Diana explains that they aren't looking to travel through time. Instead of going back and altering everything, instead of possibly creating a flashpoint, they're going to go to New Apocalypse and save their friends. And then win, Batman tells them. Well, maybe this was worth stopping for after all, Barry smiles. Meanwhile, over at Castle Bat, the Robin crows hold up the platter with the Batman who laughs a brain on it as Alfred is slowly placing it into the body of Dr. Manhattan. Meanwhile, Batmage continues to tell them to be steady as Bat Rex explains that he doesn't understand what they're doing. Batmage explains that the Blue Man is a Bruce Wayne whose body is more energy construct than flesh. He explains that according to the Batman who laughs, the body should absorb his brain and he will become a being of near unlimited power. As the body begins to absorb the brain, the fingers twitch and Bruce Wayne sits up. He seems confused though as those in the room question whether the operation worked. Batmage steps forward, standing before the new being. My name is Batmage, my lord. Be Rex and beyond. We await your orders faithfully. One who laughs, he states, but the being still seems confused. I knew it wouldn't work. Look at him. He's nothing more than a big blue vegetable. He can't even say his own name. B Rex yells, but suddenly the very fabric of his being unravels before them, and the blue being smiles wickedly. There is no name for one like me. Not yet, he tells them, when suddenly everyone grasps at their heads as a voice echoes across reality. One who laughs, Perpetua calls, and Batmage tries to warn the one who laughs, but the being has already begun to shift into a form like his old body. My queen, you call me, he asks, and the eyes of Perpetua appear before them, staring into the room. I sense the disturbance, and the one who laughs merely smiles. On the contrary, all is well here, and out there, the one who laughs explains. From the vastness of the multiverse, Perpetua looks down upon Earth-30, and she tells him that she has conquered another world and only six remain. She warns that if those of her kind sense what she is doing, they will come. Only I can conceal us. I trust you simply because you know that if you usurp me, the hands will come for us both. And my judgment, while harsh, is nothing compared to the reckoning that they will bring us both. With these final words, the light of Perpetua in her eyes disappear, and the others look up from where they were bowing, and Batmage looks back at their master. My lord, we are at your service. What would you have us do? The one who laughs waves his hand, unraveling them from reality. Nothing. He smiles, and all that remains is one of the crows. The one who laughs bends down to him, explaining that he found what the others wanted. But you, in you I sense the darkness. Tell me your story, child. He asks him, and the crow leans in, whispering his tail to the one who laughs ear, and he stands. My power is still weak. I could use a like-minded ally. Tell me, boy, would you like to be the Robin King? Crow? The creature asks, and the one who laughs nods, smiling. He explains that the boy will have a crown. He knows of Diana's plans, and he knows that she hopes to rebuild the multiverse. Well, so do I, but I am going to build something like they've never seen before. 52 planets of nightmare. Beautiful in their horror. He smiles a twisted smile and his body begins to shift and morph back as he looks at the crow. 
Now take my form, child. Do not be afraid. Blue is for soldiers of morning and light. But me, I am no dawn. Now you can call me the darkest night. He growls as his shape becomes animalistic, shifting to the form of a shadow with the very darkness drifting off of him. In the Arkham Wastelands, the heroes continue to race forward with giant bats following in pursuit. Batman, are you sure this is the location? I don't see no GPS in that bone mobile. Harley yells in the back of her mutated hyena. If he says he's sure, he's sure. Hex defends the Dark Knight firing his pistol. You're sure, right? He asks in a whisper, but Batman points up ahead where a lone scientist guards an underground entrance. He orders them to stop firing his weapon and warning them that the rounds are laced with a substance that will cause permanent insanity. But Harley's hyena doesn't slow and bites his head clean off. The heroes race underground to find nothing but darkness, but Wonder Woman holds up her lasso, the glowing light revealing the group of dark multiversal Batmen that are standing before them. You will not pass! The Devastator growls! Dark Knight, stand down. Batman orders them, and the beings quickly comply. He explains that after Barbados' attack, he created them out of Toy Master's robotics to guard this bunker in case there was ever another incursion. Wonder Woman turns to him. You're saying Toy Master made something stealth that can get us into the new apocalypse undetected? Very subtle. Batman pauses. Not very subtle. The earth around the bunker entrance begins to crumble, falling into the vast pit below, and the monstrous bats flap away, staring down at the gaping maw as something begins to rise. And from the earth, Toy Masters, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Hybrid Mech begins to rise, bringing our heroes to new apocalypse! He knows what they're going to say before he even opens up his eyes. Did it work? One asks. Is you there, sir? Another says. Sir, can you hear us? The third questions. I am here. They ask if it's really me, but really, no. I am no longer the Batman who laughs. My life was much like the Prime Earth's Batman. My parents were murdered, and I rose up to become a symbol in the night. A dark crusader. I fought alongside some of the greatest heroes on the earth while facing against the most vile evil my city had ever come to know. But unlike the Prime Batman, I was also a dark reflection of what would happen if he went too far. I can still hear the Joker's neck snap in my hands in his gasping last laugh. He had one final joke though, a toxin in his heart that was released upon his death. The toxin would make whoever killed him the next Joker. But I became something far more powerful. Batman's mind mixed with the Joker's black heart, the apex predator. But the dark god Barbados came to me, telling me that my world was also a dark reflection of Batman's fears, that we would cease to exist. He planned to drag the dark multiverse down into the dark and destroy it. I convinced him that we needed more dark Batman. And when the heroes of Earth defeated him, I would not allow myself to be dragged back into the dark. I predicted that Barbados would unleash the great mother of the multiverse, Perpetua. I engineered a plan to usurp her chosen, Lex Luthor, so that when she rose, I would rise with her, should she choose to turn against me. I knew that I could keep the heroes of Earth healed for only so long, that the Amazon would rebel and cut me down. But now I am not the one who laughs anymore. I am something else, made from a Batman that I never told the others of. You see, in a different timeline, in a different universe, a Batman found the button in his cave and decided to replicate its power. I watched him build the intrinsic generator from the shadows with a smile on my face. And the experiment went airy. He tried to fix it, so I activated the machine. It took months for that Batman to pull his molecules back together, but he became powerful enough to make and destroy words, a bat Manhattan. But I couldn't wait. It took seconds for me to stab his brain with my energy knife, to lobotomize him. And so, carrying him away, I had my path to ascension. Now floating through the multiverse, I can see it all, and I reach out with my mind, taking aspects of the most terrifying, the most vicious. I've become something new. 
Worlds where Batman has become the greatest villain on the planet. Seeing this, it dawns on me. Batman has always been a reactionary idea, born in response to the gunshots in the alley. Now that I am more, I must not be a reaction. I must be the thing that creates the reactions. I will be the bullet. The multiverse will be a dark alley and its worlds will fall like pearls before me. I am a dark god, my mind crackling with cosmic awareness as I clutch the multiverse in my shadowy, jagged hands. I know what people are going to say before I even open my eyes, and they ask me to say something, and the dark evil that I have become begins to smile a wicked smile. Bang. In another world and another time, Alfred continues to record his words, trying to lay down the reasoning for what has transpired in Wayne Manor that night. Not in all of his years did he think that this house would become a battleground. He wants to leave something behind, something to show the people of Gotham City that their prince is quite mad. If I'm being honest, the darkness was always here. He sighs. The young baby smashes Alfred across the face with his rattle, darkness in his eyes. Stuffed animals have been caught into, pets have been strangled, cars have been burned while the young boy prepared marshmallows. Schoolmates were beaten as Bruce Wayne smiled. But the real mask, his true cowl, it was men. Over and over, I covered for him. It was that night in front of the theater that Alfred tried to pick up the Wayne family when a young beat cop, James Gordon, ordered the chauffeur to move his car. Alfred was forced to comply, and exiting the theater, the Waynes began to walk around the corner with a young Bruce Wayne angry. I wouldn't have come if I'd known it was all black and white. The blood looks fake. He hisses, stepping into the alleyway where the family is suddenly stopped as a mugger pulls a pistol on them. But Bruce suddenly pulls a knife, a wicked grin on his face as he leaps at the man, stabbing him in the throat again and again. He reaches down, grabbing the gun and turning on his parents, firing several more times into the darkness. He places the gun back in the robber's hands, smiling as he does it. And eventually, he begins to work up tears, crying for his parents as the police arrive in the alleyway, brought by the sound of gunfire. Later, Alfred knew what had really happened in the alleyway. He found the boy on his computer study, looking at the assets that would soon be his. In eight years, they'll be in your name, Alfred reminds the 10-year-old boy. The doorbell rings and Alfred answers, discovering the police officer, James Gordon, at the door. The young cop explains that he had received files on his phone that point that the real killer of the Waynes is here. It's all true, Alfred begins, but suddenly a crossbow bolt flies by him, piercing Gordon's throat. Jug of this hit. Cop's not walking away from that one. And neither are you, Pennyworth. Bruce yells as he fires another bolt at Alfred. The butler moves, dodging through the house with a battle lasting an hour. But it ended as Alfred finally managed to hit Bruce with two trank darts from his gun. Alfred sighs, finishing recording his account of the events that led to this moment, when suddenly the window behind him shatters inward as Bruce leaps through it, dressed in the costume that he was creating. How do you like my new uniform, Pennyworth? He asks with a wicked smile. Bruce smiles down on Alfred as the butler loses his gun. Reaching for it, Bruce takes a bust of his father holding it over his head. Thank you, Alfred, for protecting me for all these years, keeping me safe. Until I was ready, he says, bringing that bust down. Go straight to hell, Master Bruce. Alfred snarls, after you. Bruce smiles with a sickening crunch of that bust hitting Alfred's head. He then strolls through the house, sitting in his father's old chair, beginning to ring a small bell. Hear that? It's the sound of the Robin King, and a new spring is coming. <laughs> Meanwhile, in another world and another time, Arkham Asylum, with the front gates shattered inward, the inmates are running scared. They say that the Dark Knight was swallowed by his own cave, crushed beneath the stones. It became his tomb. But in that darkness, though his body was broken, his mind still worked. Two-Face turns the wall crumbling behind him, and he suddenly ripped through it. Why be a bat when one can be a man? Why be a man when one can be a king? The inmates turn, terror filling their eyes as a T-Rex throws Harvey in the air, catching him in his mouth and eating him. Because all will hail be Rex. Meanwhile, in another world, in another time, Arkham Asylum is destroyed. The prisoners escaped as it burns in the night behind them.
Barbara Gordon was murdered on TV with people running in fear as others tried to protect her. The citizens of the city were surrounded by gangs, mobs, and monsters. Bruce looks at his computer watching the city burn. Are you enjoying yourself and watching how much I have failed at everything? Damien asks as he enters the study in his bat suit covered in cuts and blood. Failed at being Batman and protecting your city. Bruce regards his son, asking if he wants him to tell him the truth. And anger flashes through Damien, but Bruce finally stands, telling his son that he doesn't have to be him. He walks over to the bookshelf, pulling out an old book with strange symbols on the front of it. The truth is, you're not getting the job done, and while I might not be able to put the cowl on anymore, maybe I can help. Bruce explains, and he tells his son about the book, that in the 1600s, Gotham was the home to a cult that worshipped a Native American god that demanded an undying devotion. They believed that the greater the love for the sacrifice, the more the god would reward them. Damien looks at his father, confused by the story. I don't get it. So you want me to perform a secret demonic ritual from an ancient occult book to save Gotham? Bruce whispers, No. Everything that's happened, Damien, I want you to know that I never would have put this on you. This is my fault. He then brings his son in for a hug, the knife slipping into Damien's side, forcing his eyes to go wide. But together, we're going to make this right. Bruce whispers as he lowers his son to the ground, and he cuts himself, using his blood to draw the demonic symbol. I love you, son. I always have, but in order for this to work, I have to sacrifice something I love. I think we both know that there's nothing I love more than Gotham. Bruce whispers as evil light begins to fill the room. He steps into the fire and he disappears. And so he sacrifices the city. Every street, every alleyway, the city begins to rumble as the earth opens beneath it, swallowing it whole. And from the depths of the black, an ancient tower begins to rise. And in order to save his city, Bruce has become his city. The ancient tower glows as it looks over Gotham. Meanwhile, in another world, in another time, Batman looks down at the masses. Society is running out of gas. So he did what he had to do. He put part of his consciousness into every part of technology that ran the world. He can see everything. He is everything. He became a part of their lives. The people looked down at their tablets and their phones, unaware that Batman was providing them with comfort and security. But of course, the sheep revolted. The people rose up. They fought a war against the army of machines that Batman had become. The fools only wanted freedom. So Batman was systematically wiped from the face of the planet. His digital, technological, and physical forms were destroyed. But the freedom fighters didn't see a single Batmobile driving away. The imprints of the original Batman survive within this monstrous shell. And it rides alone on the destroyed wasteland of the planet. I will rise again, Batman thinks to himself. And one last story for you all to enjoy. The machine activates, twisting the energy within the Batcave. His body had died, but Batman was about to be reborn. The Batman of two lifetimes will be unstoppable. He emerges from the machine as the process finishes. Wait a minute, am I a baby? Batman thinks, his mouth unable to form words. He tumbles, unable to stand, falls down the stairs to the floor below. All right, let's review. Head too heavy to lift. That might be a problem. What else is in my crime-fighting repertoire? Soft spot on my head where a foe could potentially poke a finger into my brain. Inconvenient, he thinks lying on the cold floor. Very well. Such a conundrum might leave a lesser mortal for the amongst, but not Batman. Not when I have my ultimate weapon, he thinks and baby Batman opens his mouth beginning to cry. The three evil Dark Knights circle around the crashed mecha Batman Superman Wonder Woman. Anything Collector? Atrocitus? The Bat Surfer asks, but the Collector responds with negative. The nerd's right. No sign of life. Unless that stinking corpse counts, which it doesn't. Atrocitus snarls. But the undead Jonah Hex opens up his eyes, looking at the evil Batman. The dead do count. Hell, I can even count backwards. Three, two, one. He snaps, pushing the button on the detonator as the Batman try to stomp him. In the distance, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Harley Quinn are traveling through the world of Apocalypse, the explosion ripping apart the landscape behind them from the giant mech being destroyed. They duck into an alleyway, watching as a group of parademons that look like robins fly overheads. 
What are those? Flying monkeys? Harley asks, and Wonder Woman nods, explaining that the world is ruled by a Batman that defeated and accepted the power of Darkseid. So those are P-Robins? I'll say this, even the evil versions of you are good at branding, Harley tells Batman. I mean, it could get tacky. Bats on everything. She continues as they ride onward. Bats are never tacky, Batman growls. Nice, you should print that on a bumper sticker. As they move towards the prison where the heroes are camped, Swamp Thing suddenly shudders, gasping for air. What is it? Wonder Woman asks, concerned for her friend. I sense a great disturbance in the life force back on Earth. Something very terrible just awoke, he tells her. It's him, whatever the Batman who laughs has taken. It's just been born. We need to get who we came for now, Batman tells them, gunning the motor on his man-bat cycle. Inside the hero prison, Superman screams in agony as various shades of light are beamed onto him. Impressive, huh? Shades of kryptonite you never knew existed. Brought from the dark multiverse and infused in glass paneling. The beams will soon finish killing your Kryptonian cells. Once that happens, the anti-life will consume you. You will continue to fight the process or you could surrender to this brilliant, inescapable machine. Care of Mr. Miracle here. Bat dark side monologues, gesturing towards the captured Mr. Miracle. The evil Batman leans in, offering to spare Superman if he would accept his power and rule Apocalypse. Batman promises that if Superman gives in to his true nature, his true power, he will retire and disappear. He turns as a hole is cut into the wall of his prison and Wonder Woman steps through, carrying her magic chainsaw flanked by Batman and Harley. Release him, Dark Father. Now, she demands. And what, you'll spare me? He asks with a smug smile. Well, no one said that, Harley whispered. Dark Father yells, ordering his para robins to attack. Batman rushes over, with Superman overjoyed to see his friend. No time, Clark. Scott, how do you get him out of this thing? Batman yells across the room. You can't! The machine killed too many of his Kryptonian cells! If his feet come off the panels, the glass panels above will blast him with the anti-life and those dead cells will mutate, changing him into dark side permanently. Superman turns to Batman, telling him, Leave me. But Batman waves him aside. Shut up! I have an idea! He hisses. Dark Father knocks Wonder Woman aside, turning his sight onto Batman and Superman, and then he pulls free a weapon, aiming it at Batman and smiling. He reminds Batman that this was the gun that Darkseid used to send him back in time. But I've turned it into your life force so that it won't send you back. It'll erase you from history altogether. Beings that were pulled from the dark will remain unaffected, but your friends, your people, no one will know you existed. Dark Father gloats. He fires the weapon, but Batman doesn't move. The beams hit him, and in a brief moment, he seems to blink out of existence before falling to the ground. What? Why are you still here? Dark Father demands. <clears throat> to watch this part. He looks up at Clark, who nods, stepping off the platform. The anti-life blasts him, but Superman keeps walking. How did the anti-life not affect you? Dark Father demands, fear in his voice. It affected me. I mean, it tickled. Superman tells him, stepping up to the villain. He explains that Batman's Black Lantern ring controls the dead, which he used to stop the dead cells in Clark's body from changing. Hey, Batman, you think he's ready to retire? Up, up, and away! And in a two-snap, Superman punches the Dark Father hard, sending the evil Batman up and out of the prison in a single blow. His friends rush to his side, but Batman pushes them away. Bad blocker. I came prepared. He tells them as they ask how he withstood the bullet. Wonder Woman moves away to help Mr. Miracle and Superman leans into Batman. Does she know the truth about you? He whispers. No more than she does about you. But she needs soldiers right now, old friend. So let's help. Batman whispers back. Wonder Woman frees Mr. Miracle, asking him where the prison is actually located. Superman nods, telling her that it's right beneath them. Stand back, he orders as his eyes begin to glow. Meanwhile, in the fifth dimension, the imp screams as his head is blown off, the blood flying away like soap bubbles, and Lobo keeps firing his machine gun, chomping on a cigar as he walks through the land of imagination. There you are, he smiles at a friendly looking tree. Me? But well, Mr. Wobo, I'm just a little tree, ah crap! The cartoon looking tree screams as Lobo jams his hand into its mouth. Gotcha. Memento Memori Bass Ditch. 
Meanwhile, in the Crypt of Heroes, Dr. Fate turns, shocked as a portal begins to open. Good morning, all! The Robin King smiles as he steps through the portal. Good to meet you all! He continues looking around at the gathered heroes. Barry nods at him. Nice getup. The belt is a choice, Barry tells the small villain. The Robin King thanks him for the compliment, telling him that it took forever to make. That each compartment has a way to stop different heroes. King Robin pats one, telling Barry that this one, this one's designed to kill him. Do not listen to this fiend, Dr. Fate tells him. But the Robin King continues to smile. Oh, you're right, Mr. Kent. I mean, I'm not here to kill you. I'm here to watch him do it. He tells them, looking back at the portal. The heroes are confused, baffled, but Barry suddenly realizes who they mean. It's him. Whatever he's become, he's coming, Barry whispers, and he turns to Wally, telling the young man that the Batman who laughs is after him, after his power. That if he catches Wally, he'll absorb his energy and be strong enough to defeat Perpetua. What can we do? Wally asks. Only one thing, Jay nods, looking at the others. They all nod in agreement. Run. They all say in unison. Dr. Fate opens up a portal behind them as black tendrils of energy begin to snake around them. Go, my friends, before he can follow. The three speedsters take off, energy cracking around them, but a dark shadow follows, cackling. <laughs> Greetings, speedsters! Please, give it your best! I love a good chase, he laughs, gaining on them. He's too fast! The speed force is already weak! We could burn out if we keep this up! Wally yells at his friends, but Barry shakes his head, telling them that they need to go faster! They need to combine their speed! Their colors combine as the world wraps around them and they speed away from the Batman who laughs. Go on then! You can't run forever! Even when you slow by a fraction, I'll be right there behind you. <laughs> Meanwhile, over on Apocalypse, Superman tears open the wall, revealing the gathering of heroes on the other side. Everyone smiles at the sight of Superman. Friends, it's good to see you all again, Superman tells them. Wonder Woman walks among them as the gathering of heroes ask her what her plan is. She tells them her strategy. Wally West is the one who has the power to kill Perpetua, to remake the multiverse as it should be. John Stewart, you lead your lanterns and take down her antennas on the remaining Earths. Martian Manhunter, you and your team go after her throne. The flashes will keep Wally safe. Meanwhile, my team and I will sneak into the dark multiverse through the portal at Castle Bat and redirect Perpetua's energy into Wally. She tells them all. Everyone asks how they plan on sneaking into Castle Bat. And Wonder Woman nods, telling them that they came for the most powerful hero among them to help. The group turns, looking at the young Jaro, pretending to break rocks like he's in an old prison camp. Hey kid, Batman says, getting his attention, and the alien starfish turns, staring for a second. Dad? He whispers before leaping up to hug the Dark Knight. All right, all right, not in front of Clark. He whispers as he pats the alien on his back. Wonder Woman looks at the group, explaining that Jaro will be able to psychically block them so that she, Batman, and Superman will sneak into the castle. She looks at the group. Here when I say that regardless of blame or cause, no one wants what this universe has become. Today we reject our fate. Today we reject death itself and give this universe a second chance. Are you in? She asks the gathered heroes who all place their hands in. Meanwhile, in deep space, Lobo looks down at the last box that he collected. He prepares to open it, but the voice on the other side of his radio warns him to not even as the strange glowing lights ring out. Lobo decides against it, pointing his bike towards Earth. I hope these little things are worth it. He snarls. Back on Earth, in the Legion of Doom's destroyed original headquarters. They're more than worth it, I'm sure of it. As sure as my name is Lex Luthor. And those boxes are the death metal. And with them, I will change the story of this universe once and for all. Heroes all put their hands in as Wonder Woman calls her army to arms. They must stop the multiple crises from happening today. It's the only way to save the multiverse, but Harley Quinn stops them, asking if that means that they have to stop two crises. No, multiple as in three, Batman tells her. Wonder Woman steps forward, explaining to our gathering of heroes that Perpetua, the ultimate evil being, thrives on crisis energy. It's what she is using to destroy their reality. And that energy is coming from the Dark Multiverse, the home of the Batman Who Laughs. 
the Batman Who Laughs has created these three worlds where these crises are continually happening. Wonder Woman's plan is for her, Batman, and Superman to infiltrate Castle Bat with the aid of Jaro. Use a portal to travel to each world and trap their energies inside of an Alfred box. Harley Quinn, Swamp Thing, and Jonah Hex, you'll accompany us, she tells them, and Jonah Hex steps forward questioning whether the tiny starfish can really block that many people's minds. I'm the greatest psychic in the universe, of course I can block them, Jaro shouts out, but he quickly turns to Wonder Woman and whispers, I can, right? Diana leans down to him, of course you can. She tells him gently, but she reveals that to be safe, they're going to use a psychic amplifier that is designed by Mr. Miracle. And of course it looks like a jar. Jaro glares before climbing inside. Superman finally cuts off any questions that the other heroes have, telling them that they need to act now. He orders Martian Manhunter and Hawk Girl to make a team and destroy Perpetuous Throne so that the energy can be siphoned to Wally, and for the lanterns to destroy the antenna on the remaining Earths in the multiverse. Diana tells the others to take shelter on Themyscira and prepare for the final battle. Hear me when I say that for all the horrors, the history of the crises is a history of our triumphs. Just as we won then, we will win now. There will be losses, but we will die as one sword, one shield, and one heart. But hey, don't die, Batman adds at the end. With these final words, the group teleports away, but not before Harley Quinn tries to switch objectives. Outside of Castle Bat, Joker dragons are swirling through the smoke and destruction that clouds the air. Hideous crows, former Robins of another world, look down like grinning gargoyles as several of the Dark Knights scan the perimeter. Outside of the wire, Jonah Hex tells the group that the landscape is lined with traps, while Jaro reminds them that he can only hide them psychically, not from explosions. For a moment, the group discuss how they will get through, but it's Swamp Thing that finally decides. He orders the others to stand back as he collapses into the dirt. The green is dying, but he sinks in and takes the last of it into himself. He speaks to the remaining green of the world, apologizing for what he must do, but they gladly help, knowing that to win is to return life to Earth. Swamp Thing opens his mouth wide, creating a tunnel that the others travel through. Now fully empowered once again, the group appears beneath the earth. Thank you, my friends, Swamp Thing whispers to the group, and as they move through the tunnels, Diana reminds them that the portal is reactive to their thoughts. They need to focus on the end of the crises, on the victory. If we don't, if we land at the wrong moment, we're in deep, Batman adds, but Jaro interrupts him. Straining his mind, he sees the Batman who laughs has become something much worse, and he is chasing the flashes. He's chasing them! He's gaining on them! Jaro warns. They reach the end of the tunnel, and Swamp Thing warns them that the castle bat is on the other side. So Superman steps forward, trying to use the x-ray vision that he has left to see the other side. No. He hisses, and the wall comes down, revealing a gang of the Dark Knights. The Scarecrow Batman launches an attack at Harley Quinn with fear-soaked playing cards, but she flips out of the way, grabbing one of the cards, throwing it back at him. Batman glares up from a robotic bat suit, telling the wearer that no Dark Knight scares him now. Ha! Then it's a good thing I'm not Batman! I'm his mother! Martha Wayne calls out to him as she slams her mecha fist into the ground. The Dark Knights quickly overwhelm the group, and Superman calls out to Jaro, ordering him to take control of Castle Bat, force it to give them a way out. The walls suddenly shift and mold around them, blocking them off from the Dark Knights once again. And as they get closer to the portal, Diana finally turns to Swamp Thing. Alec, you and the others guide us when we come back, and we will come back. And Alec pounds through another portal for them, and the Trinity steps through. But as they move forward in the dark, Superman begins to slow. Wait, the anti-life is infecting me. I can sense other creatures akin to me. And nearby, there is something dark, powerful, godlike. Batman pulls out a bat flare, activating it. All of the heroes rear back as they look up at the dark god Barbatos in chains. Greetings, heroes. He rumbles in the darkness. 
Batman glares at the monster that started the first Dark Knight's Metal event, shouting at him that everything is his fault, that he is the one who brought the Batman who laughs into their world. Is it? In the last years, I've watched my realm fill with more nightmare planets than ever before. World upon world of anger and selfishness and fear and hate. And all I did was bring my realm here for you to see. I showed you what has grown in people's hearts under your watch, heroes. So, whose fault is this crisis really? The god rumbles at them. The heroes turn away as Barbatos explains that each crisis is their failure. But Superman suddenly turns, punching the god hard in the face. What? He could have called for help, and it felt good. Superman smiles as Wonder Woman and Batman look at him. Outside of the tunnel, Hex and Jaro continue to argue until Swamp Thing tells them to be quiet. Something evil is coming this way. He whispers to Harley, and a portal suddenly opens and Hex draws out two pistols. Show who you are! Show yourself! He orders, cocking those revolvers, when suddenly a grinning Robin steps from the shadows, smiling at him. Sorry, my name's Robin King, guys, and I've just come to show you my utility belt. It's got something special for each of you. Pretty neat, huh? He smiles. Finally, the Trinity arrives at the portal. Diana reminds them what they have to do. She turns back to her friends. The one who laughs is using our history to power Perpetua, but it's our history. We won together, and we will win this time too. Yes, we will. Superman nods as they step into the light. Meanwhile, back in the caves, the Robin King avoids another attack by Swamp Thing, taunting him the whole time. Hex shouts for Jaro to drop the little punk, but the psychic can't do it. I'm trying, but the little punk has a good defense. The Robin King pulls out one of his R's, throwing it. Alec roars in pain as the blade cuts through him, and the Robin King reveals that it is coated in the rot. Harley leaps into the battle, but the Robin King avoids her kick, revealing that she had figured him out in his world, and she came to his house with a mallet. You almost got me, too. Didn't have my belt back then. <laughs> he laughs as he clocks her with the same mallet. Nothing fancy for you. I just had to shoot you down with a plane. Old... He continues, but is interrupted by the thunderous gunshot of Hex's revolvers. Let me guess, you were gonna say gun, right? The undead cowboy jokes. Robin pulls out his own pistol and fires into Hex's head. Joke's on you, brat! You can't kill the undead! Harley shouts, but Robin and King just smiles, revealing that the bullet was coated with a deb rider, which eats necrotic tissue. Hex begins to waste away, his eyes turning upon Harley, reminding her that everything matters. She reaches for Hex's body as Swamp Thing brings the tunnel down around them, hoping to buy them some time. But I need to be near the portal to guide them back! Jaro shouts as the walls collapse and seal them away from the Robin King. But the Trinity, they pass through the portal, with Diana telling them to picture their victories. I see the anti-monitor right at the moment we brought him down. Batman shouts, but suddenly he's alone in a white, featureless landscape. The ground suddenly reacts to him, creatures rising up and reaching for him. You matter! Matter! They hiss. Get off of me! Where the hell is everyone? Where's the anti-monitor? Batman shouts as he fights off the creatures. The ground suddenly shifts again, and Batman finds himself trapped as a voice speaks to him. Why I'm right here, Batman? Don't you recognize me? The child asks the Anti-Monitor. Clark lands in the final crisis, but the world is wrong around him and he's suddenly struck by another Superman and sees the forces of Apocalypse. On the contrary, Kal-El, this is exactly how it should be. Darkseid tells him. Diana crashes into Infinite Crisis as she looks around shocked. She doesn't remember this moment. Because it didn't happen, Diana. A voice calls out to her as she looks up to see armored Superboy. I'm Superboy Prime! And on these crisis worlds, you lost. And that concludes Trinity Metal. But there's another spin-off that's very important to our overall plot. Speed Metal. So let's get into that storyline. Because if you remember in Trinity Metal, when they said that the Batman Who Laughs almost has the flashes, this is what was going on. The Batman Who Laughs has become something darker, more evil. Jay! Wally! Follow me! The Flash shouts as the evil entity chases behind them. Lightning crackles behind our three speedsters as they continue to run across the hellish landscape that the Earth has become. Jay Garrick questions the plan, but it's Wally who answers. We just keep running. The monster has used his nightmarish imagination to create a world with no escape. Then we'll go to another. 
Wally shouts, a crack of energy erupting on the ground next to him, and he dodges it to the side. Barry shouts to him, telling him that he has already tried that, but nothing has worked. And Jay screams that they better get a plan together, because he looks back and sees a swirling black cloud that is what the one who laughs has become. Whatever the Batman who laughs has become, he's gaining on us, he yells. Suddenly, Kid Flash is next to him, explaining that he has sensed them through the Speed Force. Wally quickly fills Kid Flash in on why he's blue and has the power of Dr. Manhattan. And the Batman who laughs wants that power from him. Barry knows that if they keep running, they're going to burn out of the Speed Force. When suddenly there's a boom behind him and a crack of energy. Wally turns back, staring at the horde of dark flashes from the dark multiverse as they rush forward. The Batman who laughs must have unleashed them in the dark multiverse to race us down. Wally shouts, I hate fast running zombies. Why did I have to send them? Kid Flash shouts, but Barry knows that if the dark flashes are connected to the speed force, it'll burn out the speed force even quicker. Aw, oh, dang, they're gonna burn it all right. Jay shouts as one of the dark flashes reaches out and touches him, his skin sizzling as he begins to slow. It's been an honor to run alongside you again, but I think this is my stop. Jay tells them as the dark flashes begin to catch up with him, but Barry is there, pulling Jay Garrick along, telling him, no flashes left behind, Jay. Wally tells them that he has a plan, dodging another of the dark flashes. He pulls the speedsters in close, when suddenly he shouts a formula. Blue energy crackles around them and everything stops. It's a speed formula developed by Johnny Quick. It taps into the speed force in a different way. I only used it to stop time once before, Wally explains. They turn back to stare at the massive cloud of darkness that the Batman Who Laughs has become. You can feel that monster pushing against the Speed Force formula, Barry tells them, and he looks at the dark flashes, knowing that they only have a few moments. The moment time restarts, we're done running, he tells the group. But Kid Flash turns and sees that they've stopped outside of the Flash Museum, and he wonders if they can find something inside to help them run faster. I came here a few days ago, searching it from top to bottom. It's all gone, Barry tells them. Barry becomes angry. He knows that they are burning the Speed Force out, and he believes that Wally acted irresponsibly with the Speed Formula. Hey, I got us a moment to catch our breath, Wally argues, and the two begin to argue back and forth until Kid Flash is shaking his head. Jay moves in a blur, smacking them both in the back of the head. Flashes don't fight, you numbskulls, he tells them. He pauses to catch his breath, feeling the strain on the Speed Force, and they try to think of a plan again, and Wally reveals that he knows that they can get an edge on the Batman who laughs. He tells them about the Mobius chair, about how it holds the secrets of the universe. He reveals that he's set on the chair to repair their timeline. The Batman who laughs tried to steal the knowledge from it. It rejected him. Now that he's gained control of the crisis energy, he wants to try again, Wally tells them. But Wally knows that they need the chair and they need to get it to Wonder Woman. We'd have to run back through the Horde, Barry reminds him. We can't constantly run in circles, Barry. We need to find a way to break the cycle. Instead of running away from the Horde, we have to run into them. Wally tells him, but Barry refuses, telling them that the flashes run forward. But Wally becomes angry, reminding Barry that he taught him not to run from danger and that the chair could save everyone. Wally finally moves away, running into the Flash Museum. Well, are you going after the boy or not? Jay asks Barry. The flashes all run inside and he finds Wally standing in front of a torn painting of the Flash family. Quietly, Wally reminds Barry that he saved the world when he was gone, saved the multiverse, saved their friends, saved their family. But I always feel like I'm running behind you, Wally says. Barry nods, not meaning to keep Wally in his shadow, telling him that he missed out when he went from Kid Flash to Flash. Barry tells Wally that he's just afraid of losing him again, of his family getting hurt. But he won't make that mistake by not standing by Wally's side. Whatever we do, we do it together, Barry tells Wally, smiling as they shake hands. And they run back to the others, telling them that they're doing Wally's plan. We're going to dive headfirst into a horde of evil flashes to run past an evil Batman into a castle filled with more evil Batman to steal a cosmic chair? Kid Flash asks. Pretty much. We're in. Jay nods. Suddenly, energy cracks around them, pain crashing through their bodies, and the others have been transformed. Their costumes now more metal than ever. It's him. I could feel him putting pressure on the Speed Force, finding cracks to get at us, corrupting it. Wally tells him. Well, then I guess we better hit the road, Jay nods. The Flashes all get ready, preparing to run faster than they've ever run before. I've always wanted to see if I can outrun you old timers anyway, Kid Flash jokes. The Batman who laughs glares at them as the formula drops and time restarts. The Flash is racing forward at a blur of lightning and speed. Nice trick, redhead, but I got some of my own. <laughs> 
the one who last cackles, ordering his dark flashes forward. The Flash family running headlong into the horde of the undead, throwing them aside with blurs of motion. They punch their way through, breaking from the pack, speeding forward. Where or where are you running off to? The Batman who laughs questions as he chases after them, gaining rapidly. Hey, Flash family! Is it true that a Flash has to die at every crisis? The Flashes keep running with Castle Bat coming into view. They plow through a group of crows out in front, but Jay stumbles. Sorry, gents. These old bones ain't gonna make it, but I'll cover you. Keep going this time. You hear me? He calls out, but Barry keeps running, punching a Dark Knight in the face as he promises to come back for Jay. They keep running, but Kid Flash can't keep up, but he tells them, I'll go back for Jay. Two down, two to go! Who falls next? <laughs> While he can feel the speed force breaking, he knows that they won't make it, and he tells Barry that he's been trying to use the Antichrist energy to go faster, but it's not enough. A tear springs in Barry's eyes as he tells Wally that he was right, that he shouldn't live in Barry's shadow. That's what inspired him. I know you can do this. Don't use that power, Wally. Use mine! He shouts, slamming his fist into Wally's back, combining their speed force. Wally catapults forward in a blur of motion. The dark flash is all clawing at him, tearing at his uniform, but his mind turns to what gives him hope. And suddenly, Wally is transformed into his classic Flash uniform. Memories of his life flashing before his eyes. And with these thoughts, Wally punches through the last of the horde, reaching the chair. He turns around, energy crackling in his eyes. Hey, Batman who tries too hard, too slow. He snarls and he sits down. The Batman who laughs cackles as Wally drifts through the speed force. Like the last time he feels himself being pulled deeper, but he knows that he'll find his way out just like the last time. He knows that he'll find his family. Wally, you don't have to. We came to you this time, Linda tells him with a smile. And Wally looks up, seeing his family standing there. What you got in the chair? You pulled this out of the fire, Barry tells him. Wally hugs his family as others reveal that they ran into the speed force when things got really bad. Everyone comes together, and Wally smiles at those that he hasn't seen in so long. Kid Flash asks if they can hide in the speed force forever. But Wally knows that the Batman who laughs will eventually find this place. He turns back to the chair, knowing that the Justice League needs them. Are you going to sit in the chair again, Dad? Jai asks him. Wally nods, telling his son that he'll do anything to save their family and the multiverse. Jay and Barry, are you up for running with me to get the chair to Wonder Woman? He asks. Always. Barry nods. I haven't felt this alive in years. Jay agrees. And he tells the others to get ready for the final fight. And the three of them walk out. Wally channels the anti-crisis energy and he returns to his blue uniform and the three of them look at each other with Barry finally allowing Wally to lead the way, lightning crackling as they rush out of that speed force. Deep in a part of the galaxy you wouldn't want to be in, in a bar you wouldn't want to be at, sits Lobo. And Lobo has a problem. He doesn't have a drink. Lobo calmly asks the bartender why he doesn't have a drink. The bartender tells him that he would love to give him a drink. The only problem is, he beat everyone to death in the bar and he used his arms to do it. Lobo scoffs as he helps himself behind the counter, stating, You're a bartender. Figure it out for frag's sake. There was one time I saw a rather inventive Galarian pour a drink with her. Well, anyway. This wouldn't have happened if someone just told me where my bounty Joe was. The bartender says that, actually, Joe is right over there. He beat him to death before anyone could tell him who he was. Lobo wipes the booze from his lips. Cool. Save me some work! This should cover the drink and the bar. He tosses a detached arm and the bartender says that this isn't even worth his... Forget it! But as Lobo picks up his bounty, a chain bursts through the wall pulling him out. Lobo looks up asking, What the frag is this? Frazetta Batman? Batman, costumed as a Caesarean, watches as Lobo gets back up and as he swings, the Caesarean catches Lobo's attack, flipping him down to the ground. That's right. We've got a Batman Lobo, or Lobo Batman. I don't even know how you pronounce this one. He tosses his bat cigar and he smiles. As for who I am, let's just say that I'm a Batman who injected himself with cesarean DNA. In the process, it added your strength and healing factor to my already impressive skills and fighting prowess. Simply put, 
I'm the Batman who frags! Lobo gets to his feet charging and headbutting the Batman who frags, telling him, Oh, I'm scared! And what is this with all the bat dudes just showing up lately? Like one of you uptight bat fetish losers wasn't enough. The Batman who frags returns with his own headbutt, hitting Lobo twice, asking, Did you really think that you could headbutt the main man? You do know that there's still a Batman under this hood, right? As blood pours down from Lobo's face, he says, Oh, I know, but there was something else about that headbutt. The Batman who frags looks down to see his battering jammed into his stomach, and Lobo gets back up asking, How does it feel to be fooled by someone who knows how to play possum? Now get ready to become the Batman who's missing a spleen! Suddenly Lobo feels himself getting sucked into a portal as he yells, Wait! I had the bastard! I had! Lobo falls flat on his back, getting up to a voice welcoming him and apologizing for the rough ride getting here. That's not how they usually like to do things, but then again, these are unusual times. As the hooded man pulls down his cloak to reveal his scarred face, Lobo jumps over to the floating rock asking, Luther, I'll give you, it's unusual times. How about an unusual kick in your bald ass? What's the deal bringing me here? Despite their differences, what's at stake is everything. Lex then opens up his cloak further, displaying several projects, all involving different forms of Batman, stating that if he doesn't accept this mission, then it all ends. Everything. Lobo scratches his chin, telling him, Well, the end of everything could solve a lot of my problems. Can't stand Superman. Every kind of Batman and Guy Fieri. But on the other hand, it would also be curtains for stuff I do like. Like babies, dolphins, brew, myself, and hell, money. Can't very well see dollars if everything's going belly up. All right, Lexi, you got yourself a deal. But who the frag is getting the bad news that the main man is coming? Soon the projections change to a box with a skull on it, and Lex says, It's not who, it's what. Death metal itself. Lobo smiles. All right. As long as I'm getting paid. But we're just kind of floating out here. Wherever this place is in space. I'm gonna need something that, at that moment, the space hawk screeches to a halt and Lobo says, All right, Lexi, I guess we gotta get this show on the road. Meanwhile, back at the bar, the Batman who frags looks down at the Batarang, flexing his muscles, pushing it out. That bastard got away. And that just don't happen to the bat main man. Yeah, I'd say someone's about to learn the hard way, something every single resident of my Gotham is well aware of. The Batman who frags doesn't send anyone to Arkham. He sends them to hell. Later at Black Hawk Island, Lobo crawls his way through the swamps asking, what is this place anyway? Someone thought you were real clever leaving this off the map. The place stinks like Jurassic shit. Better find that frag in death metal before some freak. But at that moment, a large man jumps out of the water growling. And Lobo yells, Black Monday! Should have known that you were the one stinking up the joint. How many more of you bat stitches do I gotta kill? Got you guarding the building probably because you're too stupid to know what the job really is. Black Monday punches Lobo shouting, Stupid. No, you stupid. The two wrestle their way out of the swamp and towards the nearby building with Lobo taking out a giant gun, telling him, If you're wondering where I hid this enormous gun, well, a lady never tells. Lobo opens fire laughing. <laughs> That's right! Nobody likes you! You smell bad and you got no friends! Black Monday pushes through the gunfire, putting Lobo in a chokehold, yelling, Black Monday is bad guy, but me, I'm good friend. Lobo coughs. <laughs> All right, hey, I get it. You get your job. Hell, maybe after this, we can grab a drink or something. You know me. You know, just shoot the shit. Black Monday pauses for a moment, asking, Friend? And soon, part of the wall comes crashing down with Lobo getting up, telling him, No, you lunkhead! That's just something we have in common. Neither of us has friends. Only difference with me is I don't want any! Ha! After lighting up his cigar, Lobo looks through all of the relics on display as he sees the box that he's after. He takes it looking inside and he finds nothing, and a voice then asks, Did he really think that something that powerful would just be lying around? Lobo tosses the box, telling him, No, I didn't, Hawk, dude. Hawkman goes on telling him that he knows how tempting the power can be, which is why it's been kept away for all of these years. Lobo tells him, Good, thanks for doing that. Now go on and relax. Maybe take a nap or something, because that metal is coming with me. And if that means ripping your arm off and beating you with it, Hawkman sighs. Maybe he is, and fate's helped him if it's true. Maybe Lobo is their only hope. Come. 
The metal is all powerful. Whoever wields it can rewrite history and can remake the universe. You must be careful, Lobo. As Lobo looks up at the pedestal, he reaches to the small box and takes it, stating, I'll be heavier. But just then, something explodes with Hawkman asking, Did somebody follow you here? And Lobo tells him, Yeah, I got a hunch about that. The Batman who frags starts laughing as he shoots down from his bat jet. As the walls begin to fall around them, Hawkman yells that they need to get out of the inner sanctum. There's a portal here, and honestly, there's no telling where it leads. He'll stay back, and Lobo grabs onto Hawkman as he jumps into the portal, telling him, Oh no, you're not! You're coming with me! As the two go tumbling out of the portal, they fall onto the ground, and Lobo looks around at a unicorn and crystals, asking, Frag it, Gem World! Really? Hawkman gets up, stating that he was ready to die back there. He made his peace a long time ago. Hawkman waves him off, telling him, Yeah, you can just suck it up. No one cares. Now, as for this... As Lobo opens up the death metal box, the world begins to change and everything turns to black. And what we see now is the beginning of Superman's life as he left that dweeb planet Krypton. His ship crash landed on Earth. Jonathan and Martha Kent witnessed it and were stupid enough to get out and try opening it. What they found was a disgusting cesarean baby. Oh, which one of you bastards is going to change my diaper? Next is Batman. The Waynes left the theater after seeing the terrible movie Zorro or some crap like that, except this time, Lobo is the gunman who shot down the Waynes. And then there's Wonder Woman, Cyborg, Green Lantern, and even Martian Manhunter. Every hero in the timeline is now a Lobo. Lobo sits back laughing as he looks at all of the realities, stating, I'm a damn genius! Lobo Land! All I gotta do now is just think it comes to life. And that's when a voice calls out, Attention, Lobo! Cease! This is worthless nonsense! A hand reaches out of the portal, pulling him through, and Brainiac welcomes Lobo to the Hall of Doom. Lex had secretly instructed him to make sure that he relinquishes the death metal. Now relinquish. Lobo uses the death metal to put Brainiac in a dress, and she shouts, Does not compute! You bland purse of proteins, attempting to humiliate an artificial intelligence! Your buffoonery is damning the multiverse. Lobo yells, No one calls the main man bland! My Lobo senses have revealed your secret stash, O oh guns! A small gun appears in Lobo's hand, and as he looks at it, he says, Nah, too puny. And then it grows and grows, and finally it grows to the extreme! But just before Lobo can shoot, another voice calls out to him. And the Batman who frags shoots him in the chest. The Batman who frags laughs. <laughs> Pathetic. Adios, Abistach. Lobo groans as he sits up, stating, There is only one main man, and then there's a barf bozo in combat boots. Lobo kicks the Batman who frags, reaching into another reality, stating, Fine, but before I give this thing up, there's one last thing I need to do. Moments later, the Batman who frags crash lands into the Hall of Justice, getting up laughing. You idiot! I'm still alive. You can't keep a good Lobo down. I'm gonna get my revenge. I'm gonna frag you until... But at that moment, the Batman who frags is punched to the ground, and all of the hero versions of Lobo begin to stomp and hit him, as the Justice League of Lobo rules their universe until Lobo is ready to give it up. The metal horse and its rider ride through the blasted waste that was once the world. Nightwing pulls back on the reins of his robotic horse. Get back here, you tosser! Don't you know what this sword is capable of? Bubbo shouts as he swings his blade at the creepers riding Grundy. The enemies close in on Detective Chimp, but Nightwing throws one of his lances, ordering them to leave his friend alone. Oh, look at that horse! What a fine machine! One of the creepers laughs. Nightwing nods, removing his hood, telling them that Comet was a gift from Wonder Woman. This is the fastest horse in the world, he tells them, but Bubbo merely turns away from his would-be friend. Go away! I don't need the Justice League! He mutters. I'm not the Justice League, Bobo. Nightwing tells the chimp and the creepers begin to laugh, taunting Nightwing, but they stop laughing as Hawk Girl slams into the back of them with her mace. The Grundies launch into an attack, but Hawk Girl whirls, smashing another away with her mace. Good to see you, chimp. She calls as she leaps back into the air. You two some kind of like wing-themed team? Bobo asks as he swings his sword at another creeper. Nightwing leaps into the fight, taking out two more of the creepers as Comet charges in to attack as well, when finally the creepers and Grundies flee, leaving the heroes behind. What are you doing in Slaughter Swamp? Bobo asks. Hawk Girl lands next to him, telling the chimp that they were looking for him. She nods, telling Bobo 
that they heard what had happened to his old team, Justice League Dark, and how he kept fighting afterwards. That feels like two lifetimes ago. I'm done, kids. Show's over. Bobo tells him as he walks off. They fill him in on what happened to the rest of the heroes and how they're on a quest for Perpetuous Throne. How did you two get tricked into that errand? Bobo questions. We volunteered, Nightwing tells him. As Nightwing climbs aboard, Comedy tells Bobo that they need the world's greatest detective to help them solve the greatest missing persons case ever. What do you say? Nightwing asks. And so a short time later, Bobo rides behind Nightwing on Comet as the group pulls up to the blasted remains of the Hall of Justice. Bobo nods, telling them that this is where the Hall crashed after the League's last battle with Perpetua. He couldn't explore it alone. He was aware that someone else was studying this new nightmare-fueled world that they live in. The three companions enter the once great hall, looking around at the destruction there. Chip, you said that there was someone else out here with you. Do you know who? Nightwing asks, and Bobo nods, pointing. About that, if you're looking for the Legion of Doom, he begins to say, and suddenly a voice calls from the shadows, interrupting the group. It appears that we have the same goal, Nightwing. I have the answers that you seek. The hooded man says, and Nightwing turns to Bobo shot. Are you crazy? You brought us two? But Nightwing can't finish as Hawk Girl bellows in rage. Luther! She shouts as she charges across the room, swinging her mace, nearly missing Lex's ducking head. How dare you enter the Hall of Justice? She snarls and Nightwing moves to stop her. But Lex tells him to let her finish the job. After my actions, I accept her vengeance, but it will come at a cost. He removes his hood, revealing his scarred face, and he tells them that he has walked this world of shadows, that he has learned that Perpetua's throne is still powered by Grodd, Sinestro, and Cheetah. It is currently in Brimstone Bay. If I am to undo the damage that I've done, I must free them. He says as Nightwing and Hawkgirl turn away from the villain. Now we know the throne is in Brimstone Bay. See ya, Luther. Nightwing snaps, but Lex shakes his head, telling the heroes that they are not the first to try and free the Legion of Doom. Another hero ventured to Perpetua's throne before you, and he was just as unprepared for what awaited him, Lex tells them. I know that Hawk Girl can feel it in her wings, that Perpetua has resurrected her former Source Wall jailers and created the Omega Knight. It keeps watch over the Legion of Doom. It protects her throne while she destroys the multiverse. The Martian Manhunter tried to stop the creation on his own. The two heroes discuss their options while Lex continues to insist that they need him, reminding them that the Justice League has already failed. Then it's good that we're not the League, Nightwing tells him as they turn away. Lex scoffs, telling them to go alone if they wish, but he warns them of a greater risk, a deadly Batman that acts as warden to the Legion of Doom. The Mine Hunter. In the desert, there's suddenly a loud boom, and two beings appear. Starfire and Cyborg, both shocked by their appearance and where they've arrived. The boom tube should have taken us to the Hall of Justice, Starfire. Not wherever this is. My scans are all over the place, Cyborg tells his friend. Suddenly, the pair are shocked as they are surrounded by mutated creatures. Corey, move! Nightwing shouts as the group comes running in, Lex with them, explaining that Dr. Arkham used the Wasteland's radiation to experiment on Batman's enemies and they must have escaped. The heroes leap into action, driving the mutated monsters back. What else is this hellhole going to unleash on us? Bobo mutters as the monsters run off. I leave town for a minute and you guys really let the world turn into a nightmare, huh? Cyborg jokes. Good to see you too, Vic. Nightwing smiles, and Starfire questions why she shouldn't just blow Lex apart, but the villain merely says that he has detected their boom tube and brought the heroes here to their rescue. Now that we're all one big happy family, I suggest we stay in the move. Follow me. Lex tells them, and Nightwing shakes his head, telling the villain that he won't be putting the team into jeopardy by trusting him. Lex glares at him. You're making a mistake, Nightwing. If you wish to survive this world long enough to get to Perpetua's throne before it moves again, you're going to need me. He tells him. Despite his protests, the team of heroes turn away from Luther again. I know exactly what I'm doing. By getting us away from you, I'm getting us away from danger. Meanwhile, over at Brimstone Bay, Martian Manhunter is locked in a battle over Perpetua's throne. But really, the battle is within their minds. As the Mindhunter and Jean sit across from each other in the mindscape, the evil Bruce Wayne smiles at Jean, able to sense his mind link with the Justice League. That is what I want. That connection will help the Darkest Knight. And I know what you are up to. And then we can stop you. He tells Jean, but Jean shakes his head, telling the man that he has trained himself to protect that link. 
But Bruce's smile only widens. I see that. Clever. But I'm still Batman. And your mind will be mine. He tells him. In the real world, Jean screams in pain. And in the wasteland, Hawk Girl can feel Jean's cries of pain echoing throughout her mind. And Cyborg questions his friend, asking why Jean would go off on his own. I'll ask him when we save his ass, Hawk Girl whispers. But Nightwing pulls up short on his horse, looking out over the landscape below. That might be difficult, because that's a whole lot of Staros. He whispers as they look into the valley beneath them. Slumbering Staros stretch over the ground below them, reaching as far as the sea. I miss Jaro, Hawkgirl sighs. As the heroes begin to tread their way through the Valley of Staros, Vic fills them in on their adventures in space. Nightwing and Starfire lag back a short ways, with Dick filling her in on everything that has happened since they went into space on the Justice League Odyssey adventure. Before his eyes, though, Cory begins to shift from her heavy metal attire to her original costume. He pauses, but suddenly she is back to the present, and he pauses again, hearing a voice that almost seemingly whispers in his ear, telling him to wake up. You're going to be okay, but you need to wake up! The voice cries. Dick suddenly sits up in a hospital bed, and Alfred is leaning over him in concern. Master Richard, you're safe. Alfred tells him Batgirl standing nearby in the Batcave as the butler explains that Dick had a concussion from the KG Beast bullet. You gave us a scare there, Barbara tells him with a smile. Nightwing leaps up, hugging the man that he thought was dead, but in a flash, everyone changes again. Their costumes and appearances morphing, and Dick is shocked as he tells them about his dream. It was more like a nightmare. He whispers, when suddenly appearing in his bat suit, he realizes that this world is the dream. What are you talking about, Master Richard? Alfred asks. Batman will be back soon. You could talk to him then, Barbara tells him, now sitting in her wheelchair. They morph again, now wearing their younger costumes. Dick standing before Batman dressed as Robin. You've been through enough. It's time you went back, Batman tells him. Hawk Girl stands before Jean as the Martian asks her to come with him. Cyborg stands before his father who is alive and well, and Cory is standing with her sister. Bobo with Nightmaster and Robin with Batman. This isn't real, Dick whispers. Wake up, you fool, Lex screams as he knocks Nightwing out of the gaping jaws of a Starro. I said that you would need me, Lex shouts as he pulls the hero away. They dash through the valley as the Starros rumble and move, with Lex explaining that they sleep until someone is dumb enough to offer themselves as lunch. In their own dream worlds, the other heroes begin to snap out of their stupors, fighting against their illusions. But it's not quick enough. Nightwing and Lex stop, looking up as the heroes turn to them, still under control. Starro might be a giant starfish, but he's a conqueror, and he knows the best way to defend himself is by controlling your team to kill us! Meanwhile, Jean screams as the Mindhunter continues to assault his mind, searching for his link to the Justice League so that he can learn their plans. Over in the Valley of Staros, the heroes continue to battle against the illusions in their minds, but in the real world, the heroes have turned on Lex and Nightwing. They leap and dodge out of the way of Starfire's energy blast, but Lex explains that he built up a tolerance against Starro's mind control. Nightwing questions how the heroes are controlled without any Starro's attached to them. It's in the air! We're breathing it in! Lex yells, realizing the problem. He grabs a hold of Cyborg, ordering Nightwing to help him as he hotwires the hero. This is going to work. Vertigo should do the trick. Lex shouts as Nightwing grapples with his friend from behind, when suddenly Vic's arm cannon erupts in energy, blasting the ground around them. The heroes suddenly snap out of their stupors, shocked by what is going on, and Starfire moves quickly to help Nightwing to his feet. Did I hurt you, Richard? She asks, but Nightwing smiles, telling her that he's only singed. She glares at Lex, but Nightwing tells her that he's the one that saved them. Hot Girl points out that Bobo is still missing, but the team is interrupted as the whole ground begins to shift around them. Nightwing puts his hand on the ground, realizing that the valley itself is breathing. Guys, the whole valley is one giant Starro. He shouts as the monster begins to shift and lift its massive body upwards. The heroes begin to flee with Nightwing spotting Bobo. He steers Common to the horse towards the detective, lifting him up off the ground quickly as Bobo continues to mutter to himself. It's not real, chimp! Nightwing yells, and Bobo continues to talk to Nightmaster, thinking about just sitting back and letting the world end. But Nightwing smacks his friend out of his dream, bringing yells of shock from Bobo. Lex leads them all the way to the shores of the sea, and it is there that he shows them the boat that he pieced together from parts of the wasteland. I have christened her Lana, he tells them. Starfire continues to hold back the stars as the team argues against going with Lex. Again with this foolishness. <sighs> 
but it's Nightwing who steps in, reminding them that they don't really have a choice. I tried to lead, and we went headfirst into a literal nightmare. He turns, boarding the ship, telling them that if they want to save Jean and stop Perpetua, then they have to follow Lex. So the heroes all board the ship, and they draw away from the shore, with the still-raging Starro looking back at them. The team then turns to Bobo, who shouts angrily at them for bringing him out of the dream world, for bringing him back to this nightmare around them. They try to calm him down, but Bobo finally tells him that they aren't the Justice League. We're the Suicide Squad. It's Starfire who gives a look of determination in her face from that. Then it will be a good death. If this will be our last time together, I will go down fighting, she says, raising her fist. And they all look to Lex, asking where they're headed. With his notes in his map, Lex smiles as he leads them through the darkness that the world has become. Their journey takes them through the dark oceans, fighting against the beasts from the depths, past smoking volcanoes, and finally to Brimstone Bay. Do you have a plan, Lex? Nightwing asks in the deck of the ship as they stare at the tower that holds Perpetua's throne. Of course. We don't go in with power. We must act as thieves in the night. Lex tells the hero as he glances at him, but Hot Girl suddenly falls to the floor with a scream. She can feel that Jean is close and that they must go to him, but Lex steps forward. No! That could jeopardize everything. We must act now before Perpetua's throne moves again. But Hawkgirl looks up, shouting that Jean needs her. The world has more concerns than you being in love. Lex snaps. Hawkgirl leans up, punching Lex in the face, and then she leaps into the air, calling out to them as she flies away. Once Manhunter is free, he can help us against the Omega Knight. Get to the throne and be ready, she says. Nightwing yells to Lex that they need to catch up to Hawkgirl, but the villain shakes his head. No, she's right. Finally, someone who understands being a hero always comes with a cost. So at the tower, Hawkgirl flies upward, shocked to find Jean wounded on top. Meanwhile, the rest of them sneak up to the tower, and Starfire and Cyborg try to keep the monsters busy while Lex and Nightwing sneak around. But the Omega Knight is already waiting for them. Kendra turns, shocked that the Knight knew that they were coming, but Jean begins to morph. Because of you, Jean's guilt keeps him from fighting back. But you were first and foremost in his thoughts, made it easy to access a connection and call you here. The Mind Hunter gloats as he stands up. So that you can watch your friends die, Hawk Girl! He cries as the Omega Knight opens fire on the heroes below. Meanwhile, Bobo watches the destruction from the deck of Lena. Sadness fills his voice as he pets the horse. I told Nightwing and Starfire I didn't want to be a part of this, but I can't watch my friends die again. We need a miracle. Comet, any ideas? He asks the robotic horse, and below, from the destruction of the Omega Knight, Nightwing tries to crawl away, and in her mind, the Mind Hunter is gloating at his victory over Hawkgirl. He needs Jean's connection to the rest of the Justice League, and he wants her to help him get it. Bite me! Stop with the games inside of Jean's mind and face me in the real world! She snaps, when suddenly they are once again flying through the sky, and the Mind Hunter is shocked that she lashed out at him. Kendra readies her mace, telling the Mind Hunter that Jean trained her to defend her own mind. I don't need his help to kick your ass! She snarls as she lashes at him with her mace, but the Mind Hunter suddenly transforms again, morphing into a giant bat monster, meeting Kendra in battle. On the ground, Nightwing is struggling to his feet, calling out to his friends in the destruction created by the Omega Knight, only to see the Omega Knight standing over him. Come on! If I got my friends killed, I earned this. Just get it over with already! He cries up at the monster, and as the blast is about to hit him, he is suddenly yanked off his feet. I'm done watching my friends die, kid! Bobo yells as he pulls Nightwing onto Comet's invisibility, and they speed away. Comet can turn invisible? I guess you really are the world's greatest detective. Nightwing laughs as Bobo explains what happened. The two heroes began to scour the battlefield, looking for their friends, when Kendra continued to fight the Mind Hunter in the sky. The Bat Monster grabs her with his talons, throwing her heart against the tower alongside Jean. The Mind Hunter reaches out, grabbing the Martian and holding him up. Watch as I use my heat vision to burn your love. Say goodbye, hot girl. The Mind Hunter snarls, but Jean reminds this version of Bruce that he's also part Martian. Jean turns his head, shooting his own heat vision to heat up the end of Kendra's mace. Hawk Girl then rushes forward, slamming the weapon into the Mine Hunter. Superheated Nth Metal! She shouts, and as the monster falls away, Jean falls before Kendra. I'm sorry, I should have. He begins, but she stops him, pulling him in for a kiss. Shut up, Jean. Help me find my team. She tells him as they fly down to the battlefield. Using Comet's invisibility field, the heroes regroup at the shore, and it is Nightwing who suggests that they retreat and return with the other heroes. 
There is no backup, Nightwing. It is us and us alone, Starfire tells him. She informs him that she knows that he wants to return to a past version of himself, but they all need to continue to move forward. Cyborg nods, agreeing that they can do it together. Lex sighs. Oh, please. Can we get on with it? I thought I was working with the Justice League. If I had known that it was the Teen Titans, I would have come alone, he tells them. And at that moment, Kendra and Jean land with the team. The Martian glares at Lex, reminding him that they have much to discuss after this is over. And Nightwing finally smiles, petting Comet, as they go over the plan. They decide that a frontal assault is their only option. If we free the Legion of Doom, we might have a shot at destroying the throne before it moves again, Lex suggests. The team charges forward with Vic, Jean, and Starfire attacking the Omega Knight. The others leap onto the tower, trying to free the Legion of Doom. Their bindings are too strong, Lex! Nightwing calls out, and Lex nods, knowing that their last option is to destroy the tower with the Legion still attached. We don't have enough power for that, Lex shouts. Bobo begins to climb the tower, telling the others that he thinks he has an idea. Climbing to the top, Bobo turns and begins to yell for the Omega Knight. Hey! You Frankenstein Omega Titan! I thought you were supposed to be scary! You want a piece of me? Bring it! The Omega Knight turns, firing his energy blast at the tower, and the explosion throws the heroes and the knights to the ground. Recovering, Nightwing pulls himself to his feet. Dang! Chimp, you did it! He whispers as he looks at the fallen knight, but he glances at his feet, seeing Bobo's helmet. Thanks for saving us, boy wonder. A voice calls from behind. Nightwing turns to see the Legion of Doom standing on the destruction of Perpetuous Tower. The destruction that contained the throne. Now who's going to save you? Cheetah asks. Nightwing leaps away from Grodd's attack, car wheeling through the air, but he is knocked off balance as Cheetah meets him mid-flip. Your cat-like reflexes are impressive, boy wonder! She snarls when suddenly the ground quakes as Martian Manhunter lands with a mighty blow. Enough! He bellows. Cyborg steps forward, ordering the three villains to stand down while they explain the situation. We don't take orders from you, Cyborg. Grodd rumbles. And Cheetah questions what happened to the world with Sinestro smirking. My readings of the world are very unusual, Cheetah, he tells her. Lex steps out of the shadows, telling his former allies that they have lost. But I have come to rescue you, he says. One of Sinestro's constructs slams Luther to the ground, and the others move forward to attack him. You betrayed us to Perpetua! Grodd snarls. Lex agrees, knowing that he made a mistake. But I will rise and show the world that I am Lex Luthor, and the Legion of Doom can rise with me again. You sold us that lie before! It's time you paid for it! Grodd cries as he prepares to attack Lex's head, but he is thrown aside as Starfire blasts him with energy and Hawk Girl lands, reminding the Legion that they need Lex alive. The Legion attacks them, and the heroes and villains meet in battle, with Nightwing pulling Lex aside, trying to keep the villain out of danger. Why did you save me from their vengeance? Lex questions. You saved me from Starro. Consider us even, Nightwing tells him simply. As the two groups continue to fight, suddenly they are interrupted as Bobo rides over the hill, ordering them to stop. You dummies are too busy fighting to see that the Omega Knight is not dead! He warns them, and behind them, the Omega Knight has begun to rise back up. Even though one of its arms has been severed, the being attacks, blasting the group with its energy. The two teams are thrown away by the power of the blast. We should run! There's no reason to battle that monster! Grodd tells the group as they all begin to pick themselves back up, and another blast hits them with Sinestro throwing up a shield to save them all. The construct begins to crack, and Nightwing leaps in to push Sinestro out of the way. If we leave the Omega Knight, Perpetua will know that you survived the throne and come after you. If you want to keep your freedom in your lives, we have to stop the Omega Knight now, he tells them. He orders Jean to connect the group telepathically and leads them on a charge against the monster. He orders Hot Girl Jean and Starfire to attack the knight to try and make it mad. And Lex and the Legion rush to the remnants of the throne with Lex hooking Sinestro back to the machine to amplify his power. This will burn out all the extra forces, including the ultraviolet spectrum. Lex warns Sinestro. Huh. I prefer the color of fear anyway, Sinestro sniffs, blasting the Omega Knight in the chest, burning a massive hole into the monster. The great creature falls, creating a massive quake as it slams into the earth. And with it finally done, Bobo turns to look at the villains that have gathered. Hey team, what now? Isn't it obvious? We get back to what we were doing before the giant attacked. Yeah, we kill Lex. Grodd rumbles in agreement with Cheetah. Lex stands before them knowing that he broke their trust. I can earn it again only if you join me, 
he tells them, letting them know that they can reach their goals without the help of the League. But Jean steps forward, reminding Lex of a conversation they had a long time ago, when the Martian first asked Lex to join the League, and he refused. There is an Earth saying that we also had on Mars, If only I knew then what I know now. But you do know now, so I tell you this again. The League could use your help, Lex. What path do you choose? Suddenly there's a massive boom and the Legion of Doom are gone, teleported away via boom tube. Please tell me that Lex couldn't have used a boom tube that whole time. Cyborg mutters and the group agrees that it doesn't matter and Jean informs them that he has a link with the Green Lanterns and they are all going to meet on Themyscira. How are we going to get there? Bobo asks. We'll find a way, Nightwing tells his friend, and the group begins their journey with a few brief steps. How can you be so sure? Starfire asks. Because we're the Justice League. Nightwing answers with a smile. Elsewhere, the Justice League is facing the massive visage of the Castle Bat. As all hope seems lost, a blast of energy hits the monster, and the group looks up to see the Hall of Doom floating above them, with Lex standing ready to join the fight. Batman gasps into the white nothingness. Struggling to stand up, he grabs the Alfred box to try and warn Wonder Woman and Superman that the anti-crisis energy that they are trying to gather, it is coming from these crises, from the dark multiverse versions of the end of the universe. But in these universes, these dark multiverses, they lost the battles. And the Alfred box is taken from Batman as the anti-monitor stands before him. You are going to warn them that these are the versions of the crises where you lost. And that is correct, Batman. I won against you and your friends a long time ago, the Anti-Monitor tells him. Over in Final Crisis, several boots slam into Superman's chest as the other Supermen stand above him, ordering him to stay down. But the Man of Steel attempts to struggle, questioning what the other heroes are. And he turns his head, seeing the mighty Darkseid sitting upon a throne that is made up of his fallen friends. There is no one here but Darkseid, Kryptonian. I control with the anti-life anything that breathes. I speak through everything in this place. If you wish to speak to me, kneel! He commands and Clark looks up, shocked to feel that this is the one true Darkseid. I am. By your perception, I entered this world only months ago. But here, I have ruled for eons. I am an old god by now with only one task left to secure this reality. Superman tries to reason with the Dark God, but Darkseid isn't listening, revealing that his final task is to submerge Clark in the fire pit and rebirth him as Darkseid's final son. No, don't do this, we can still win, Superman begs of him, but Darkseid begins to bring him to the pit, promising that when he awakens, he will know true happiness. Meanwhile, over in Infinite Crisis, Diana awakens to discover Superboy Prime before her. She tries to reason with him, to tell him that everything in this world is a lie. No, Diana, it is a dream, or of what was, what should have been, and now, what will be again. He tells her, showing her images of his world, a world of happiness where the heroes inspire the people with their goodness. He reveals that he went to the Batman who laughs after he was freed from the source wall. He saw the chaos that was coming. To make sure that there was one world where the heroes remained, I sought him out. I was the one who made the promises, and all I had to do was give him you. Prime tells her, cradling the Alfred box. In the land of Gotham, the Flashes are continuing to run ever since the Speed Metal event. The dark shadow of the Batman who laughs closing in on their heels. They can feel the Speed Force burning out, but Wally still hasn't been able to get in touch with the team at Castle Bat. Meanwhile, over at Castle Bat, Swamp Thing is trying to hold the Robin King at bay, ordering Harley to continue to run. But Jaro stops them, sensing the Flash family is almost out of time. What do I tell them? He shouts. There's nothing to tell them. Diana and the others have not returned from wherever they went, and there is no safe place to bring the Flashes. Swamp Thing tells him, but the wall begins to cave in, interrupting him, revealing the Robin King's vicious grin as he holds the head of Jonah Hex. Excuse me, I think you might have dropped this back there. <laughs> he cackles, so Harley tries to reason with this young Bruce, asking him to leave them alone, but the Robin King pulls out a knife, telling them that it was forged by Neron, the Lord of Hell, and if you are stabbed with it, it will send you to the deepest pit of hell. Hex coughs, looking at her. It's okay, kid. I got it coming, but you don't. Please, run. 
the Robin King attempts to stab him with the blade. And Harley snaps, snarling at him, I'll kill you! As she leaps across the room, but Jaro collapses the entire chamber, blocking Harley Quinn from reaching the Robin King, sealing Jonah Hex's fate. As they continue, Jaro says that he can sense the Alfred boxes in the dark multiverse, but he can't sense Batman, Superman, or Wonder Woman moving. What the hell do you think is going on down there? He asks. Diana is trapped, still trying to reason with Superboy Prime. Don't do this, Prime, she begs of him. But Superboy tells her that she did this. She left Wally exposed. She had the lanterns destroy the antenna so that the world would go somewhere else. You gave me everything that I needed, he tells her. He explains that moments from now, he will redirect this crisis energy to the one who laughs, that they will power him up, and he will make these worlds real and lasting. I'm saving you, Diana. Saving you all. If making a deal with the devil is the only way to do that, then so be it. Meanwhile, Batman can feel himself being torn apart as he asks the Anti-Monitor what he is doing to them. Doing? Not doing. Undoing. You are the last bit of matter in all existence. Once you are gone, I can finally devolve. Then all will be still the boy tells him. Batman begins to be pulled apart as the Anti-Monitor is watching. Meanwhile, back with Superman, he's being lowered into the fire pit, pleading with Darkseid not to do this. And the ruler rumbles. Superman is. While he burns the Alfred box in his hand. Superboy Prime looks down at the box in his hands, and he prepares to send the energy to the Batman who laughs. Look, I'll admit it, you're right. Diana tells him, telling him that the world isn't what it used to be because the only constant is change. But she asks him to picture the multiverse where all the worlds exist, each unique and connected. He can have a world like this one and it won't be alone. It won't be created at the expense of others. It's the dream prime, the real one, she tells him as she puts her hands on his shoulder. Superboy Prime turns and he backhands her through the wall of his fortress. She pushes off and they rush at each other, locked into combat. What good is a world of hope if it is born from evil and death? She asks him. Batman is being torn apart. Superman emerges from the pit and the flashes continue to run, aware that they cannot outrun the Batman who laughs any longer. Superboy Prime and Wonder Woman are continuing their battle, slamming each other into the walls. You talk about an endless multiverse, but all that means is that another world could destroy ours. That nothing would be safe! You're just taking some shot in the dark, Diana! He yells at her. You're right, but isn't that what all of this is? Diana coughs. Superboy pauses. Superman, isn't that all he is? Diana asks, and Superboy Prime screams, bringing his fist down. Wonder Woman, Superman, Batman, and Superboy Prime come back up out of the dark multiverse. They arrive in front of Jaro and Swamp Thing with Wonder Woman calling out to Jaro, letting him know that they are on their way. I'm here, but you need to hustle! The flashes, we're out of time! He tells her. Wonder Woman turns back to Superboy, ordering him to target Wally with all of that crisis energy and the beam shoots out of the Alfred box. Almost at the same time, the four heroes emerge in the portal, crashing into the doomed earth. We did it. Wonder Woman cheers, and she pulls herself out of the crater to see Wally sitting on the Mobius chairs. Guys, I don't think it worked, he tells her. Suddenly, the Batman who laughs reveals himself. Before you came to Gotham, I rigged the Mobius chair to redirect that power. To me! He cackles. So let me be the first to welcome you to the last 52! I know, I know. This is the part where you're expecting someone to give you a pep talk. The Robin King smiles as he steps up to the fallen Wonder Woman. I could use the one that Wonder Woman gave me on my world. Telling her how the Wonder Woman of his world gave a speech about never giving up and that the heroes managed to defeat him. He holds up a medal to her telling her that the people in his world gave it to Wonder Woman for stopping the Robin King. But I had already booby trapped the medal with God Killer Sword Needle, so I killed her and then the world fell to me. But that speech, woohoo! Diana glares up at him as the Robin King begins to start the speech, but he is interrupted by a rumbling dark voice. Robin King, come, you can kill them soon enough. The one who laughs calls. Diana struggles to her feet, demanding that they fight now, but the one who laughs merely smiles. The fight is long over, Diana. You lost the moment you struck me. Now if you'll excuse me, I have a god to kill. 
he tells her, and the one who laughs flies away, ordering Castlebat to hold the heroes until his return. The building quakes around them as it begins to fold in on itself. Yes, my lord. The castle rumbles. The building forms a stone version of the Batman, and the heroes rush to attack it. Everyone take a limb, Diana orders, and the heroes try to fight the literal castle. But none of their attacks seem to be working. If this creature is my consciousness, infused with Gotham, it's made of every material produced in Kane County. As the heroes begin to fall, Batman shouts for Wonder Woman to escape. No, we can beat this, she shouts. And seconds later, Batman is trapped by the living castle. And as Castle Bat's hand begins to close around Diana, it wonders how it should destroy her. Regardless, this is where you meet your... The castle rumbles, but suddenly it is hit by a powerful beam of energy shattering. I think the word he's looking for was doom. Lex calls out from the Hall of Doom. The heroes are gathering and Diana looks at the scarred Lex Luthor. You're supposed to be dead. Much of me is dead, Wonder Woman. What's left is offering you refuge in the Hall of Doom. But you must hurry. The heroes climb aboard with Harley questioning what Lex did to Castle Bat. And he smiles, handing her a snow globe, explaining that he transferred Castle Bat's soul into the tiny version of Gotham. And he will be trapped here for centuries. Harley nods, smashing the globe into the ground, stomping it with her boot. Or you could step on him, I guess. Lex says with a nod. Diana questions why the villains have come, and Lex tells her that it's time to end things, once and for all. Meanwhile, out in the multiverse, Perpetua is looking down on Earth-49, one of the last Earths of the multiverse. It is time for you to choose your god. Will you side with me and become a part of my universe, or with death? She questions the world when suddenly a dark voice rumbles from behind her. Actually, I go by Darkest Night, or the one who laughs, but I'm often mistaken for death. The one who laughs rumbles. Perpetua turns, throwing Earth-49 at him. And on their Earth, the heroes and villains watch as the sky erupts with a blinding light, and the sound of an Earth dying rumbles out over the landscape. It has begun. Lex intones, explaining that the one who laughs will kill Perpetua, and then use their fears to build his own nightmare universe. Right now, he only has a handful of baby Earths. We need to act if you'll hear me out. Lex tells the gathering of heroes. Clark looks at him, telling his enemy that a part of him has no interest in listening for what Lex did to free Perpetua. But seeing what's happened to you, say your piece, Clark says. Lex nods, looking at them all. To gather more crisis energy, he believes that they will need to think small rather than big. Batman steps up, demanding to know what Lex means. The plan, ears, is this bistach. Lobo snarls as he steps into the room, holding up a small box that he had been sent to collect. And if you want to know that story, check out Death Metal Extreme. Lex nods, taking the box, explaining to the group that once they had defeated Barbados with Metal X, the Monitor had locked the shards away on different levels of reality. Lobo was one of the only beings who could obtain them all, Lex tells him. But Diana shakes her head, stating that the one who laughs is too powerful for 10th Metal to defeat him. Lex nods and tells her that the only thing that can fight the one who laughs is the truth. Like great inventors throughout the ages, Lex has invented a machine that will seek out the truth. The Metal X shards can guide you there so that you can take the machine, he tells her. And he tells her that if she can build his machine, it will unknot the timeline and restore everyone's memories, connecting everyone to the truth, creating a powerful stream of anti-crisis energy that Diana can use to defeat the one who laughs. Diana is confused, believing that the crisis energy was more powerful, but Lex shakes his head, explaining that it isn't true, when suddenly Diana remembers her fight with Perpetua, remembering being afraid of unknowing the truth and laying the world bare. She steps up to Clark and Bruce. Tell me the truth, please. She asks them quietly, and Bruce stares at her for a moment. I'm dead, Diana. I've been dead this whole time. I died after the first battle with Perpetua, when the Batmen first invaded is how I've been using the Black Lantern ring. I'm sorry. He tells her. Clark steps forward. There's no changing me back. I can feel it. For both of us, we're ready to fight with you one last time, as long as you'll have us. Clark tells her, realizing that he is going to become Darkseid if he stays this path. And the three friends embrace each other. Diana turns away, striding through the room and explaining that they will unknot the world and lay everything out, but it isn't enough. They need to bring the one who laughs to them. She turns to Lobo, asking about his regeneration powers. 
The Caesarean bites his finger, drawing a drop of blood. All the rumors about me are true, but yes, there is enough of the main man to go around. Lobo tells her with a rude smile. Diana nods, turning her back to her friends, telling them all to take a moment to do whatever they need to to bring them peace. So, Clark travels to the prison, asking the villains to join them. Let me guess, you want us villains to join up with you heroes to save the Earth? Giganta asks. No, I want you to help me destroy it. Clark tells her as his eyes glow. Meanwhile, Diana, Lobo, and Lex hover over the Rock of Eternity. Lex nods and tells her that this is the quickest way to forge worlds, and he hands her the journal of Carter Hall, telling her that his design is at the very end. Lex leans in, telling her that this is her task, that Superman seeks the best in people while Batman curbs the worst. But you, Diana, you seek the truth, he tells her, and she nods, readying herself. All right, my main men, let's do this. She orders, leaping into the air, and behind her, an army of lobos follow close at her heels. Floating in space, Clark readies his group as they prepare to attack the Earth. Clark, what are you waiting for? Superboy Prime asks, taking one last look, just in case. Superman tells him. He nods and the heroes launch themselves at the planet, and in the midst of their battle, the one who lasts can feel the Earth under attack. Those are fools! He bellows, and he tries to pull away from his battle, but Perpetua stops him. We finished this here and now, she tells him, and the one who laughs throws his dark worlds at the battle, ordering his children to stop the heroes of Earth. And on the wasteland of what is left of our Earth, Superman can feel the evil Earths approaching and orders everyone to get ready. Batman nods, looking back at his army of undead heroes. Everyone, let's show them what a real Earth can do, he yells out, and suddenly the sky splits and the dark Earths arrive. The heroes all look up, staring in disbelief at the number of worlds that tumble towards them. What do we do? Guy Gardner asks. We do what Diana told us to do. We fight like there's no tomorrow, Donna Troy shouts out. Earth Prime, 1984. A young Clark Kent sits in a convenience store reading the latest issue of Superman. In this world, Clark Kent isn't Superman. He's just another young teen living in a world where the only superheroes are the ones that come out of the comics. And very much like Superman, he too was adopted. He was found in a field abandoned. It always made him feel unwanted, but he had Superman. He always had Superman until Superman betrayed him. However, as Clark sits and reads his comic book, Kenny Braveman tells him that he knows the toll for coming in here, and it's time for him to pay up. Clark tells him that he can't. The only bit of money that he does have is to buy a comic, and he isn't giving it to them. Kenny laughs, looking at the comic. Superman is lame, and he takes the comic and he rips it in half. The rest of Kenny's friends begin to gang up on Clark Kent, when suddenly Kenny has a drink thrown at him. Lori, the store owner's daughter, tells them to get out of there. They're banned for life for destroying merchandise. She picks Clark back up, telling him that he was pretty brave to stand up to Kenny like that. And that is when everything changed. Clark and Lori began to see each other more, going out on dates, and really thinking about their future together. So when Halloween came around, Clark and Lori dressed up as Superboy and his mermaid girlfriend, Lori. The two went to Hamilton Beach for the party, and while there, something was pulling at the back of Clark's mind. Like something was calling him. He closed his eyes and he began to run. And then he jumped, and he fell flat on his face. Lori helped him up, stating that it was a nice try, and the two go back towards the rest of the group. But then they see a shooting star, and Lori tells him, Make a wish, Clark. Seconds later, Clark begins to fly into the city, where he is met by the real Superman. To anyone else, this would seem strange, but not to Clark. He's read about an infinite number of parallel Earths in the comic books that he's read. Everything that he's read, everything that he's read about, it all turns out to be real. Superman tells him that they need his help as the multiverse is collapsing into a single universe. The only thing is, this Clark, he never got to say goodbye. He wasn't there when Laurie died, or his parents, or his friends, and when the adventure was over, they were all gone. Clark tried to accept it, but it was difficult. And when there was a chance to bring Lori and everyone back years later, he had to try. He was in such pain that he lashed out and he became a monster. To the others, he became known as Superboy Prime, or now just commonly called Prime. The Batman Who Laughs is doing what a bunch of other villains tried to do, remake the entire multiverse in his own vision. 
It felt like Prime already knew this story, like he'd already read about it, so maybe that's why he understood things a bit different than the others. Though it still didn't help since everything in this universe was turned upside down and jumbled together like the greatest and worst hits album. The worst part about it is that he doesn't care anymore. Everyone dies and comes back. Even he has killed a few himself, and they all got rebooted. So what does it matter? What does anything matter anymore? The heroes don't want him there, the bad guys don't want him there, so what is the point of Prime? And as Prime sits awaiting the coming battle with everyone else who arrived at the final battle at the edge of the multiverse, he hears a bark. Crypto sits in front of him and Prime asks what does he want? You stupid dog. Crypto barks again and Prime reaches out, petting him. Prime smiles as he remembers the first story about Crypto. Just then, Connor calls out asking what is he doing, and Prime yells back that he wasn't doing anything. Your dumb dog came over here. A flying dog with a cape. How stupid could you? But before he could finish, there's a rumble signaling the beginning of the end. The Batman God created 52 worlds and he filled them with other supermen designed to destroy this group. But what they didn't realize was that Prime wasn't like the other supermen. He was the most dangerous. So the evil supermen attacked him, all spouting off the same thing as every other villain does. They tell him that he's beneath them, that they are from the future and everyone here, especially whoever it is that they are fighting, is barely a footnote in their history. Prime punches one of the supermen because it doesn't matter, he doesn't matter, and then something happens. As Prime hits him, he sees something. An image of that Superman's world and it changes. Why? What did he just do? Prime flies up into Earth's orbit to see the other 52 worlds that the Batman Who Laughs created and thinks that maybe he could use these. Could he change all of these if he kills the monster? He crashes into the projection of the Batman Who Laughs with an earth-shattering GRAGAGAGOOM! And again he sees something, a world, his world, and Lori. They were happy. They had a child. And then it all fades and it's replaced with screams, pain, and anger. Where is that bad guy hiding? The Batman Who Laughs laughs in the shadows, stating that there is more to him than one would think. You're a funny one! Prime punches into him while focusing his heat vision, telling him, Go ahead! Laugh! Laugh at me! You've overstayed your welcome. The Batman who laughs tells him, Oh no, I'm not going anywhere. However, I can't say the same for you. Prime swings with another booming punch, telling him, I said laugh! The Batman who laughs chuckles, telling him that he'd never laugh at him. What he meant by funny was that the two of them aren't so different. Prime yells, We are different. I tried to do the right thing. And the Batman who laughs knocks Prime back, telling him, You could have anything. All you'd have to do is stand aside. Wouldn't that be a waste of energy killing me? Prime charges in, punching the Batman who laughs one more time, putting all of his strength into it, shaking the very foundation of the universe. And he won. The Batman who laughs power, he could take it. He could take it and destroy all of this and rebuild his own world. He'd have Lori back, but why would it matter? Everyone hates him so he can hate back. And then there's a bark. Crypto stares and Prime asks, what is he doing? Get out of here, you stupid mutt, go. Crypto sits beside him and the Batman who laughs tells him, we can't destroy each other, so let me help. One of these worlds could be yours. All the people down there fighting, they aren't worth it, Prime. Join the army of supermen. You can have what you've been so desperately wanting. Prime can see it. A world where he is loved and respected by everyone. Where he is a hero again, the kind that he always wanted to be. But his parents wouldn't be there. And neither would Lori. So Prime tells Crypto to go, and he closes his hand one last time. All that anger, all that rage, concentrated, focused onto one point, and Prime let his dreams go. Everything begins to shatter, and the reality of what could breaks. The shockwave travels down to Earth where everyone is fighting and they all begin to see the evil worlds disappearing. Supergirl asks, who was that? They gave them a fighting chance and Cyborg Superman tells her whoever it was is dead. No one will ever know who it was that gave them the fighting chance except Crypto. And Crypto howls over the lifeless body of Superboy Prime. As everything begins to fade 
and Clark blinks his eyes, reading the comic, asking, Wait, what's going on? I was fighting in this comic. Is it about me? At that moment, Lori knocks, asking if he wants to get some lunch at the diner. And Clark is surprised. You, you, you can't be here. Laurie tells him, right, right. You want to be a left alone to read. Forgot it was Wednesday. Or do they come out on Tuesdays now? Clark stares at the comics and he puts it down, stating, We should be outside. I don't need to finish this one. Lori laughs. Okay, let's bring the dog. Clark is surprised. Dog? I, I don't have a... But at that moment, a dog very similar to Crypto runs into the room, barking. Clark pets him, telling him good boy. And as the two go out, Clark asks Lori if she remembers much from the night on the beach. And she asks, how couldn't she? He tried flying into the sky and he fell in his face. You're the Clark Kent without powers, remember? The two laugh and as they head up to the sidewalk, a child chases his ball into the street right in front of an oncoming car. And without a second thought, this Clark begins to try and save that child. Lori yells at him asking, what is he doing? And he tells himself that he's trying. Even if he doesn't have powers, even if he's not, Oh, he lifts the car above his head and he turns to her. Maybe my story isn't over. I guess they never really are. But maybe you should go outside for a walk too. And that was Superboy Prime's participation in the final battle. He got his own issue for his events. All the other superheroes get lumped into a different book that we're going to be covering very soon. But what were the superheroes doing before they went to that final fight? This is Dark Knight's Death Metal, The Last Stories. Once a hellscape, formerly known as the Paradise of Themyscira, Donna Troy sits on the beaches tracing her finger in the sand. But then she hears a voice asking why she's alone. She looks over to see Beast Boy, who tells her that this is the same beach that Steve Trevor washed up onto when his plane crashed. When she was Wonder Girl, she too came here hoping something would wash up that would change her life. Beast Boy laughs. <laughs> I'm here now. Problem solved. I'm still allowed to joke even if it's the end of the world, right? Donna goes on telling him that even if this is their last night together, tomorrow is going to be the greatest fight of their lives. She still would like to make one last wish. And after what Diana said, she's worried. The Justice League lost, Wonder Woman lost, the Batman Who Laughs remade their world into this nightmare. And now the Batman Who Laughs fights with Perpetua over which one of them will finish the job. Donna gets up. It's a lot to take in. We've seen so much, but never a crisis of this scale. How do we know if we're ready for a war like this? Beast Boy laughs. <laughs> yeah, about that, we have all the titans of the party. After Wonder Woman, Batman, and Superman told everyone the plan, people started to show up. And it's not everyone who was in the titans, but he'd like to think that they're here in spirit. The two walk over to the field to see the titans who have ever been. And Beast Boy says, even Robin's new kids are crashing. Though I'm not sure if they count. Donna tells him, of course they do. Maybe they're just drawn to each other. That's how it's always been with the Titans. Being a Teen Titan or a Titan was more than just a name. If you were young and hoping to make a difference in the world, you were always welcome in Titan's Tower. As Beast Boy runs off to talk to a few people who showed up, Donna smiles, stating that she knows a pair of troublemakers when she sees them. Garth laughs. Ha! Look who I found leasing the Justice League on a do or die mission. Donna says that the word of our new apocalypse was that he was riding a horse in a new costume and Nightwing responds. Yeah, uh, me, Starfire, and Cyborg all changed back the moment we stepped foot in Themyscira. But I have to go. Batman called a meeting and there's something else that I need to take care of. However, as Nightwing leaves, there's a bolt of lightning that strikes down in the middle of the crowd, setting a tense mood for everyone. And Donna asks, why is everyone? But at that moment, through the smoke, Wally West stands up. Everyone stares as Wally waits, and the first to move is Donna. He says that he knows that he's not welcome here and he understands that. They have every right to be angry at him after everything he did. But he had to tell them he... Before Wally could speak, Donna hugs him. It's okay. You don't have to say it. We know. However, the feeling of dread washes over everyone and their hope fades. Donna smiles to herself, telling everyone that the Justice League couldn't hack it as Teen Titans. Ever since they were kids, they've gone up against the same challenges the Justice League did, sometimes worse, and now they're on the eve of the greatest battle of their lives. They are standing around doing what? Feeling sorry for themselves? Cowering in fear? Think about how much the universe has put them through. How many times has it tried to kill them or bury them? There are days it feels like it hates them, but the Titans came back every time. Because no matter, when you fight one Titan, you fight all the Titans. But as Donna gives her speech, Garth stops for a moment telling Donna that she needs to see this. 
Everyone looks over to see Batman calling out. The blackest night falls from the skies. The darkness grows as all light dies. We crave your hearts and your demise. By my black hand, the dead shall rise! From that, a dead Roy Harper pulls himself out of the ground, and he walks over asking, <laughs> Did you guys think I was going to miss the big fight? After all the hell that I've been through? I'm one of your best chances at winning this thing. You'd all be goners without me. Wally looks over at Roy, and as Roy looks back, he tips his hat. Donna tells everyone a war is coming, and the Batman who laughs new multiverse will be here soon. And she knows that they are ready. She made a wish on the beach earlier. They aren't just teams. This has made them into family. And if this has to be their last night, there is only one thing that she'd wish for, and that is for them to be together. The battle ahead will be hard, but whatever happens, they're never alone. The next story is Last Nights. Through all the destruction, Hal Jordan is a little shook to see his father's grave intact. The world has become so twisted, so damned upside down, that he wasn't sure Coast City was even still here, let alone his dad. Everyone is off focusing on their own preparations, and if this is going to be his last night in this world, then there is one thing that he'd want, to just fly. Perhaps it's selfish, but he just needed to feel this one last time. The freedom, the weightlessness, no cares, no fear. Up in the big blue sky, there is nothing holding him back. Maybe the last thing dad remembered was that freedom. But he knows that the last thing his dad ever felt was actually fear. Dad learned that everyone who flies eventually falls. And a few moments later, Hal flies over the Valley of the Rainbow Rings, thinking that he just wanted to fly so high that he could see the stars. And when it's his turn to fall, will there be any monuments, any markers, or will there be only darkness? A voice calls out stating that he didn't expect to see him here. After all, this may be his last night. Hal charges up his ring as he looks at Sinestro asking, What do you want? And Sinestro tells him, Easy, we're on the same side. Remember, at least for this day. But this whole affair, it feels different, doesn't it? It's truly final. I thought maybe. Hal glares asking, What? Oh, you, you want to... Are you kidding? After everything you've done, all the pain that you've caused? Sinestro looks at his ring, stating, It's how I started, after all. Hal tells him, No, you don't deserve it. And Sinestro looks at his ring, telling him, No, I suppose not. Or maybe you're right. Maybe a little fear is what we'll need tomorrow. Until then, Hal watches as Sinestro sulks walking away and thinks to himself that maybe in the end, you see what you choose to see. What your heart wants most. Maybe his dad did see the blue sky. Maybe he needs to believe that. And at that moment, a Green Lantern ring lifts from the pile, and Hal guides it over, stating, It's never too late for another chance. I of all people should know that. All you've got to do is say the words. Sinestro takes the ring in hand, and he begins to say the mantra. In the brightest day, in the blackest night, no evil shall escape my sight. Let those who worship evil's might beware my power. Green Lantern's light! As the green glow fades, Sinestro says that he'd forgotten. Forgotten how it felt to not be afraid. He won't say thank you. Hal looks up. I wouldn't ask you to, but there is something I need you to help me out with. Let's see if there's any blue left up there. The next story is The Question. Diana stood on the twisted ground her sisters once called sacred, over the remains of her enemy as she has done so many times before. But this time, she felt nothing. She stands out in the field, Hippolyta telling her that she did what she had to and now she must prepare to pull all of her heart's strength for this one final task. She did what she thought would end all of this. And Diana asks, is that what I did? Hippolyta says that Batman's plan, but Diana stops her, telling her that she will not fight for the salvation of a few. She threw down her sword when she saw it was the only thing standing between him and the slaughter of all of her sisters. As Diana leaves, she hears a voice calling out to her, and the Riddler steps out of the shadows, telling her, It's been too long, which is to say that it's been a long, long time, which is to say that we never talk. But I do have a question. Diana asks what is he doing, hiding in his cell when he's been freed. She's not his warden now. Riddler laughs. That's not true. This cell might be the safest place for a nice guy like me, instead of charging into certain death, which is by far a worse sentence. But back to my question. What do you call a creature whose greatest strength is their weakness? Someone who can never win and never lose. A person who must fight for justice, but brings an end to justice. Diana stares, and without giving any time, she gives up. Riddler yells, A Wonder Woman! 
Of course you never give up. You're always ready to fight. And with that, Diana leaves. She tells herself that she isn't ready, that her strength was that she was the universe's greatest warrior. Is it that when she killed the Batman who left, she felt nothing because there is no victory? How can she fight when she feels nothing? Voice tells her, because she's Wonder Woman. Donna Troy steps through the fog and Diana asks if that's her. She says one of them. Her world was a pit stop of destruction for the Batman who laughs. They weren't ready, she wasn't ready. When the planet died, she felt everything inside of her collapsing, like she'd folded up on herself, smoothed out all of her edges until she was nothing. But she knows that they're all embedded inside of her, every lost, every soul incinerated when the fight between the Batman who laughs and Perpetua set the planets in the multiverse aflame one by one. It's who they are, it's what makes them superheroes. Batman has his own personal torture, but for her, the pain that sears her soul, it's the pain of all suffering. For every crushed soul, that's what she gets. And when the time comes, she'll feel it all. The pain that drives them, that makes victory the only option. That is who they are. So a short while later, Diana returns and her sisters ask if she is ready for the upcoming battle. She places her hand on her chest and she tells them yes, she is. The next story is called The Dust of a Distant Storm. Up on a building overlooking Themyscira, Ollie and Diana look down at the rubble with Ollie asking, shouldn't the sun be up by now? Diana tells him that in the morning, they fight a fight that they cannot win. Let Dawn sleep. Ollie says that he's not ready to concede the election yet. They did their best, though everything they did. Any regrets? Diana thinks for a moment and says, she would have liked to have an oath. Just something cool that they could say when suiting you. I was always slightly jealous of the lanterns, to be honest. Diana then asks him, what about you? Ollie pauses for a moment and then says, Actually, you'd laugh, but I kinda wish we had a real first date. We went from intense dislike to boudoir in no time flat. He then jumps down the hill telling her that he has an idea. He owes her a proper date. Regrets be damned. So after a little bit of scouting, he managed to find these. They're essentially an Amazon sea ration, but... She looks at the wall of rationed food and states that she's impressed. She pops the top of the vial and drinks it, and then immediately coughs it back up, stating that it tastes like battery acid and pee. But as Ollie looks, he looks past Dinah, asking what are those? Just then, two giant Joker sharks jump out of the water, and the two begin to run while Ollie yells, I'm sorry, I'm sorry! Dinah turns back to blast them away, asking if he planned this date to have Joker mechs. And Ollie says that he may have forgotten about those, but this just makes him want to ask for a once-in-the-lifetime favor for the life that they were supposed to live. Will she stay behind with him in the morning? Dinah says that he knows the answer to that, and Ollie tells her, yeah, I'm a lousy first date, so let's tackle the other regret. Maybe a little rough, but... I'm the wall, I'm the shield, and I do not run. I see the evil coming towards you, and I do not run. I stand between you and the darkness, and I do not run. That's it. That's the oath. Dinah pauses for a moment, stating that she thought he was about to get on one knee, and... But Ollie asks, is that really bad? And Dinah tells him, yes. Here, yes. When the man that she loves asks her to marry him, she'd want it to be in a place of hope, where all the options in the world are available and he'd still choose her. Ollie leans in, stating that he guesses it's a good thing that he wasn't thinking that then, huh? But at that moment, a voice calls out that they're sorry to interrupt, but they've been looking for them. The two quickly get into defensive stances, asking who this person is, and the young girl in a green hood says that she came from one of the worlds that got, well, you know. Ollie tells her that it's okay, what's her name, and the girl pulls down her hood, showing her face, stating that she goes by Black Arrow. But her real name is Laurel Lance Queen. Ollie and Dinah stare for a moment and ask, That's our... Laurel says that she doesn't want anything from them. Her parents are gone, her family is gone, she just wanted to meet them. Ollie tells her it's okay. Let's get a good look at you. You have your mother's eyes. Canary eyes. But that's when she laughs and tells him that on her Earth, their roles were different, like backwards. Ollie turns back telling Dinah to come look. She's practically there, and Dinah says that she knows what she practically is. Hi, just, hi. Laurel laughs, stating that she's going to fight with them. There's nothing they can do to stop her. Dinah tells her that she knows. She will be there under his wing, so stay close. And this, this is for all of them. Dinah recites the oath that Ollie gave her, and then hugs Laurel, stating thank you for reminding her what they're fighting for. The sun is coming up. They should all go get ready. And as the girls leave, Ollie reaches into his pocket, taking out a ring. And he quietly says, Ah, oh, well, regrets be damned. The next story is Whalefall. Along the coast while everyone gathers, Aquaman does not. 
He sits perched on his rock as the tides come in. The last place that he'd ever want to be on is dry land, especially on the eve of his death. Nor would he have asked that he be burdened with his thoughts or the people that they have worked to save from this nightmare that has swallowed everything. In their eyes, he is the Admiral of the Black Fleet, a traitor, a collaborator with the destroyers of all that hold dear. He cannot argue, he cannot blame them. He has been those things for far too long, for reasons that he can only hope that they will one day understand, and so he returns to the depths. He journeys down below into the darkness, now standing against the Black Fleet. He never thought about dying, now that's all he can think of, but he still does not regard it with fear or anger or sadness. For two worlds that share so much, they are still eternally divided over so many things. For them down here, there is no end to life. The currents roll infinitely, never ceasing, merely unseen deep below the surface. The old give up their place to the new, the predators feed, the prey can only run for so long and each piece fulfills that part. Even the kings who rule over their domain will fall. They are only given so many days. Their efforts are finite. For those above, it is darkness, an enemy more monstrous than anything that Dark Knight is bringing back from his dark world. The deal he made with Bathomet was to protect the sea and all of those who dwell within and to preserve the world above to keep their people as safe as he can ensure. The land dwellers fear death more than anything because they know how easily it can come for them all. Cast aside, buried in the earth in a purchased box, remembered only by those who survive until they succumb as well. Down here, most of their kingdom is in darkness, firmly out of reach of the sun, where nothing can grow or live. The water is on the edge of freezing, the pressure so great it cannot be measured. It can feel like a fist squeezing out any possibility of hope. The key isn't life, it's the need to flourish. Death is a much more powerful tool. Down here, a blue whale's body rests. She lived 80 years free in these oceans, following whatever urges she had and did whatever she wanted to do. She had a family, gave birth to her own, watched them grow and build theirs. She loves the feel of the sun on her skin and the cold snap of the waters below. Until the day that she stopped and the waters she called home carried her down to her next one. Her body became the seed of an eternally new life cycle. In death, she became a home. They've already fed on her flesh, and when those were done, more will come. Species of life, novel even to him, will make themselves known, grow strong down here, broken down until she becomes a part of the soil, moats in the water. Her death will feed them all, lights bright in the mists of the darkness for decades. But there is no loss in dying. It is a gift that they give to those who outlive them to the worlds that they have always loved and the ones that they have come to love. The possibility that he will fall in this final fight, it is his own whale fall, a final gift to them, to both worlds. His reign will be passed down to his son, Andy, one day. All of the things that he's done in this fight were to ensure that his son has a world to inherit. Being a king or what they call a hero, none of that matters a moment compared to being a father. His son and his mother filled the world with sunlight and the music that cut through it all, enough to keep him warm wherever his new home will be. Be kind to your mother, be kind to yourself. If I cannot be here to say those things to my son, I will still gladly fall, because I cannot think of a better possible world than one with him in it. The next story is the fight for love. The night has come, and Batman watches over everyone as they make their final preparations. Have they done enough? or are they marked to die? In this futile mission, they only have one weapon that can pierce the heart of an enemy to win the day. And as Batman stands, he feels the touch on his shoulder. He hears a voice telling him that he looks tired and that they still have a few hours. He tells Batgirl that there's too much to do, too much to say. She's always been a leader. She sees solutions in different ways. He underestimated her in the past and for that he is truly. But Batgirl stops him. We're already dead, aren't we? Batman says maybe, but we can still fight for the living. It's what we do. Someone might live on, someone we love, and I hope it'll be you. Gather the boys. We have time for one last Bat Family meeting. Batgirl does just that, and as she gets Nightwing, he'd rather talk to her before them. There are things that he wants to get off his chest before, but she stops him and tells him that there's no need for that. She does not need to be reminded of how deeply he hurt her. Whatever he has to say, just keep it to himself. She doesn't need him throwing emotional bombs at her before the final fight. As everyone gathers, Batman says that he's going to skip to the end. The end of what's important here. Do we all have what we need to get the job done? 
Everyone looks at their supplies, and as they all pool their resources, Batman smiles, telling them, We are ready. Except for them. Batman places his hands on both Batgirl and Nightwing's shoulders, telling them that they need to skip to the part where it's resolved, because he needs them in the headspace now. Nightwing says, Fine. Barbara, marry me. Batgirl stops him. Wait, is that where you think this ends? Batman waves his hand, telling them, By the power vested in me by no one, you're married. Done. Now let's give the newlyweds some space. As they're left alone, Nightwing says, So, we have tonight. And Batgirl tells him that they could be married tonight if he wants. But it doesn't stand if they live. Nightwing says, of course. If they live, it's void. Annulled. Until he can win her back. Batgirl asks, Does he really think he can? And Nightwing tells her that he hopes to have a lifetime to try. From the moment they met, she was his other half. And we end with our final tale before the final fight. The Man of Tomorrow. As Superman thinks to himself, he knows that he can't be everywhere at once, or can he? Instead of spending his time with Lois and John, saying his farewells, he's working. Even now, with all that's gone on, seven billion people are afraid that this is their last day on Earth. Half the human race has shut down in terror and despair, and the other half has surrendered to anarchy. Choosing them and his family seems impossible, but Superman doesn't believe in the impossible. His son is back from the 31st century. His time bubbles damaged, but pieces survived. By melding them with the last samples of a few rare Kryptonian elements, he should be able to improvise a makeshift chronal device capable of sending him back in time approximately one hour. The world is in absolute turmoil. His friends are concentrating and providing aid and keeping the peace, controlling the moment, but he is choosing a different path. His hour is up far too soon, and there's still so much left to be done. So much that can be done. If he risks activating the time shift device again to relive the same 60 minutes, There'd be two of them. Two supermen to set an example. Not enough. What if he made it three? In fact, until the time shifter gives out, he can keep using it ten times, a hundred times, a thousand supermen to lead by example. For the first and last time in his life, for one precious hour, he can be everywhere that he is needed. This is a job for Superman, to pull people out of their despondence, to make them feel less alone, to give them confidence in the future. And if they're going to survive this night, they have to be able to picture the sunrise. They need to believe that tomorrow will exist. They need hope. He had thousands of hours to dread this moment, but they've helped him come up with the right words. He tells them where he's going, that he doesn't expect to return, that he loves them. He tells them goodbye. So let them make the most of it. The monsters of the Dark Earths begin to drop onto the battlefield, twisted and grotesque copies of the true Earths. They roar and bellow with an animalistic rage. Superman stands ready, his hair blowing in the wind as he orders his army of Earth's heroes, villains, and citizens. God, I wish I still had my hair. Look at you, you fiend. Lex whispers jealously. The Dark Earth warriors are ready, showing the heroes of Prime Earth their numbers. Fine, let's show them ours. Batman snaps as the fighters of Prime Earth gather and prepare for the final battle. Harley nods, pointing out that the Dark Earths have way more fighters. So what? We got powers, we got heart, and we're way hotter. Jaro shouts from her shoulder, and Batman looks at Clark, pointing out that the one who laughs didn't have a lot of time to create these Earths. I was thinking the same thing. This might be his whole army. Batman nods, throwing down his bag and using the Black Lantern Ring to resurrect the dead body of the former Batman who laughs. We're getting ready to attack! Swamp Thing shouts, and Harley lifts her hammer in anticipation. You wanna say it, kid? She asks Jaro. All right, everyone. Freaking charge! The tiny starfish shouts. Language, kiddo. Language. Batman shouts at his sidekick. The battle is joint, and in the darkness of the passage to the Forge of Worlds, the passage is supposed to hold the world's fear. But Diana believes that there is no room anymore. Lobo suddenly turns as the darkness shifts, and it warps. Laughter begins to echo all around them. Look out! He screams as the hands begin to lash out, attacking him and his clones. It's him. The one who laughs, the fear of him taking form. He's the last terror in existence. Diana shouts in the cosmic realm between the multiverse. The one who laughs and Perpetua continue their battle. The ancient god is becoming tired and she tries to reason with the one who laughs, offering a deal. Sure, 
How about I kill you and take the last of your power? Sound good? <laughs> he cackles at her, and she whirls, blasting him with energy. The one who last screams in pain, lashing out with his own power. Their energy crackles as Perpetua tries to explain that if she dies, the hands of creation will come. When they see what you've done, it'll be the end of us all. She cries out, and the one who laughs smiles. Do you promise? On the remains of Earth, the heroes continue their battle. Batman swinging his scythe, rallying his family. Superman flying through the battle. Omega beams shooting out of his eyes. The Flash is running and fighting. And in the darkness, the Lobos are trying to protect Diana as the laughter continues. And he finally yells for her to run, to take the book and build the machine. But she continues her battle until finally one of the Dark Hands grasps the journal and pull it out of her hands. She screams as she she plummets into the darkness, and as she finally falls free, she lands in the Forge of the Worlds. No, 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 the journal! She whispers, but a voice rumbles to her from nearby. It would have made a little difference, Darkseid tells her. He tells her that the Forge dims by the minute, that the one who laughs creations have no soul or hope, and when the heroes of Earth die, the Forge will spark. No! There has to be a way to win! Diana shouts defiantly. Back in the space between the multiverse, Perpetua has lost. She cries out, telling the one who laughs that she only wanted mankind to be what it was meant to be, and he laughs at her, covering her in the stones of the multiverse before shattering her to pieces. Meanwhile on Earth, the heroes cheer as the forces of the Dark Earth begin to retreat, and Clark stands strong, watching the darkness fall back. That's right! You better run! Booster Gold shouts out. This place may be a dump, but it's our dump! Clayface rumbles, but Batman isn't cheering, and Superman walks over to him. Something doesn't feel right, Batman tells his friend. Jaro agrees, and the others begin to feel something different as well. I feel it. The one who laughs is coming. Abigail, the avatar of the rot, whispers, but a booming cackle fills the battlefield. I'm already here! <laughs> the one who laughs gloats. In the time that it took you to cheer, I've realigned the Earth. I've finished creating all my planets, all my armies. Here are my favorite soldiers, the ones that I've been saving for your last moments. So say hello to your darkest nightmares before they kill you. <laughs> He cackles, and Batman stares at a new army of dark mirrors. Clark, I just want you to know our friendship. I know, brother. Superman tells him, and Clark turns to the rest of the army. Everyone, this is it. Gather your families. Fight alongside them. We go out together, Superman tells his allies. But meanwhile, in the forge, Diana stares in disbelief. A disbelief that she has failed. That it all ends here. Darkseid rumbles and he gloats, but suddenly Diana knows what to do. She reaches out with a lasso of truth, dipping it into the molten lava of creation. On Earth, the Bat family gathers around Bruce, both heroes and villains alike. The forces of Atlantis gather with Arthur Curry, the Lanterns, the allies and foes of Superman. Lois and Clark hold each other. Get a room! Someone shouts, and the people of Metropolis gather around their hero, apologizing for not joining them before. But unseen to them, the lasso of truth begins to connect everyone. They become one planet, one universe. Clark looks up. He can remember everything. The entire history of the multiverse laid out before them. I remember it all. Diana? He whispers, and suddenly the ground begins to quake and split open, and Diana emerges, a golden god! The one who laughs? You want to fight someone? I'm right here. She bellows at him. This brings us to the issue. Dark Knight's Death Metal, The Last 52. The final battles. Another tie-in. As the final fight draws closer, Diana is reminded of a time when she was younger. She attended the funeral of the fallen warrior named Ella, who had led her sisters into a great battle against Hercules. Many statues are put up in the Garden of Rose, and now Ella could be among them. The young Diana thought that maybe now Ella could be with her friends again, that maybe her death isn't anything bad, but a vision of Ella told her no. Death is not a blessing, it is horrible, and she must fight 
on as Diana stares face to face with the Batman who laughs, God to God. She knows that she must fight. She went to the Forge of Worlds to find a way to stop the darkest night, and it is there that she realized something. They are one universe. They all matter, even him. Lex Luthor designed a machine that would force them to see the truth, but in reality, the truth was, it was in them all along. And it is time that she brought it out of the one who laughs. She wraps her lasso around him and he smiles asking if she just wanted the truth. All you had to do was ask all the worlds created. It is your nightmares. And we are also so much more. Worlds where the damsel in distress killed her saviors, where the Boy Scout finally saw that humanity was beneath them. Even a world where the Ocean Mother turned her monster child into a weapon of war. Can't you see? These worlds are your truths. These are what you'd become if you dropped the pretentiousness and let the real you shine. You and your friends are a great lie in the multiverse. The lie that there is a hope. And out on the battlefield, the heroes begin to fight with hope. Hope that there will be another tomorrow after this. That there will still be a world to call home. Even as the twisted version of Wally West takes aim to kill everyone, the original tries to stop him. Wally catches the bullets, realizing that this version of him is a version from a world where things aren't an accident, where he liked it. The dark Wally tells him no. I loved it. Barry was famous for dying, right? How about we make you famous too? But before the twisted Wally could pull the trigger again, there's a thump as an arrow is shot into the back of his head. The reanimated zombie Roy Harper tells him that it wasn't him. Not by a long shot. Wally that he knew was a good man and would never act like a tool. He was there with him. We were both hurting. And there's no hard feelings for what happened. But you do owe me. Now, how about we forget the guilt trips and take down some of these ugly boy wonders? I'm up two to one. And so the heroes press on even as all hope is seemingly lost. There are always friends beside you to help keep that spark alive. But as Diana watches, the Batman who laughs whispers in her ear that she knows war better than most. Hope on the battlefield can be a killer. So gaze upon the reality of this lost war and tell me what you see. As the different possibilities span across, the Batman who laughs asks, Do you see it? What do your friends not want to admit? What is the truth of the battlefield? Diana tells him that war, war has no happy ending. The Batman who laughs tells her, Exactly! Yet the others keep fighting. Heroes and villains working together for a common cause. And they all risk their lives for you. You are no god. Gods are cruel like me. So you will submit, you will fall, you will bend the knee. And if you ask nicely, we can stop all of this fighting. All the pain can stop. And your final moments will be peaceful while the multiverse turns to nothing. I will gift you that blessing. Diana turns back to her childhood once more, seeing the statues of Ella's fallen. A second statue is being constructed of Ella beside them. But as the young Diana watched, her mother asked if Ella. Diana stops her. What did Ella mean? That death has no blessing. Polita says that during the war with Hercules, Ella's faith wavered. She prayed the war would just end. The reality of war scarred her. She believed that she lived because she didn't push herself as hard as her sisters. And if she had given her all without fear, her sisters might have lived as well. She would rather have given everything and died there than her death would have had meaning. So the Batman who laughs asks again. She could stop it all right now. Just say the word. Diana pushes back telling him no. She'd rather die. The Batman who laughs cackles in delight. Now that's the spirit! <laughs> I knew you had it in you! <laughs> who better to be the harbinger of death to the multiverse than the avatar of truth? Your death cry will signal to your world that the end has finally come. Diana pushes forward, telling him that the only sound the multiverse is going to hear is the sound of her kicking his ass. Meanwhile, over with Superman and the side story, first and the last men. The ground trembles in the wake of the fighting Superman, but Superman stops for just a moment. He watches as all of the Supermen surround him and says, It doesn't have to be like this. Saint, an evil variation of Superman, tells him, Yes, yes it does. Superman looks past him, telling him, I wasn't talking to you. 
I was talking to the last son. Saint laughs. laughs. He has nothing to say. But Superman ignores the comment, flying up, trying to convince the last son that things don't have to be like this. Remember what your S stands for. Join us. Fight for what we've always stood for. The last son clenches his fist and punches Superman to the ground with a thundering crawoom. Superman rushes back fighting, telling him, You've got to be in there somewhere. Some part of you still believes in the truth, in justice, in tomorrow. The last son punches again, launching Superman with a crackagagoom back into the ground without saying a word. Everyone watches as Saint tells him, This is a lesson. The Superman laid low because his principles stand between him and victory. As blood drips from Superman's face, he stands up telling him, I don't need to win. All I need is to believe that I still can. That's what hope means. Superman and the Last Sun fixate their eyes on one another, and with all of their energy, they focus their heat vision, blasting away, creating a massive explosion. But as the Last Sun still stands, Superman falls to the ground exhausted, and Saint tells him, That hope is a refuge of the insignificant like you. It's embarrassing that we share the same name and blood. How about we just wait for hope to save the day? Surely it'll be here any. But at that moment, a voice tells him, Sure as shooing. Superman looks up to see Henshaw, Luther, and Zod all coming to aid him. Henshaw states that Superman has been a pain in his side for a long time, but considering the situation, Saint grabs a pointed rock ready to slam it into Henshaw, shouting that only the mighty will prevail, but Superman punches him back, knocking him away, and then falls to his knees. He tells Supergirl that he doesn't have anything left. The anti-life. Don't give up. We still need. And she tells him that they won't. Superman doesn't ever give up. And we are all Superman. Over with Batman and the Batman who laughs. Batman watches over the fight and he knows that even he has his limits. He has to know them. You can't fight alongside gods and aliens without knowing how far your body can go. How many punches can you take? How many can you dish out? How long can you stay on your feet? How long can you stay awake? He himself has trained a lifetime to be able to push past that point, but his family is still alive and approaching their limits. They are beginning to fade. Their hits are landing softer. Their breathing is getting shallow, and they have made him so proud. This might be the end of everything. There's no choice but pushing past that limit and beyond human capabilities, beyond death. Batman stands up and he tells everyone that they must get behind him. They need to advance together. At that moment, a blade pierces his back and comes out of his chest, and the Batman who laughs reanimated corpses ask, Together? Together? Really? The voice makes Batman's skin crawl, so much like his own, but so much colder. That isn't him. It's just a corpse of the original stitched together with the power of the Black Lantern Ring. The real Batman who laughs is fighting on a much grander scale, but this rotting husk shouldn't be able to resist the control. The Batman who laughs cackles, asking, Isn't it sad to know that all of these little kids are going to die? Batman lunges back, asking, Who do you think you're talking to? And the Batman who laughs tells him, I'm talking to myself! Isn't that the whole point? All I wanted was to just have a few last words at the end of everything. Here's the way I see it. Either the big cosmic version of me is going to win, or we're going to turn this whole multiverse into a weapon and kill whatever god or source is out there in the omniverse. So what is done here doesn't matter. Or he's going to lose, and all the pieces might get put back together. A big, bold new multiverse with a new dark multiverse trapped down there like it used to be. Batman asks, What's the point? And the Batman who laughs lashes out, telling him, It means that I need to keep whoever survives this battle afraid! Afraid enough that it counts. So no. I'm not going to fall in line, and you're not going to take their hits. I'm going to slit as many throats as I can before this twisted world falls apart, in one way or another. Batman falls back. He laughs. The Batman who laughs asks him, what's so funny? And Batman tells him, you're thinking about this whole thing backwards. I've realized that there's only one person that I need to keep afraid. The only person who knows exactly how dangerous you are. The only person who can picture each and every horrifying thing a Batman can do if he's stripped away of every bit of decency. The Batman who laughs tells him, You! And Batman laughs, <laughs> That's right! Me! I will make damn sure that there is no fighting. 
and I will do everything in my power to forget. All that will be left of you is an echo of an echo, until you crumble away like everything else in the dark multiverse. The Batman who laughs pauses for a moment and then bursts out laughing. It would seem that we need each other, just as much as the other. It is funny. Batman who laughs falls in line and both corpse and man laugh at their own realization. Meanwhile, over with the Atom and unstable Atoms. The Atom, Ryan Cho, stands in disbelief. He shouldn't be here, but then again, none of this should be. But Mr. Terrific and Dr. Magnus had an idea that they would integrate Terrific's T-Spheres into what's left of the Metal Men adding flight capabilities. If the Metal Men could get inside of the Dark Earths, then there'd be a chance that they'd be able to shift the worlds out of phase, slowing down their nightmare creatures. It's a good idea. You might even say that it's a terrific idea. And he knows it won't work. He's fighting alongside gods and magic and hellish monsters. Science has no meaning here. What difference could the three of them possibly make? And then there's an explosion, and it should have killed them, but it didn't. Instead, Adam gets to see his own dark nightmare. Maybe it has to do with the barrier between worlds melting, or the type of inverted radiation pouring off onto him. Either way, the second that they see each other, they both understand. A world like theirs, at least to start. But this him? He let his limitations and fears take over. He stopped questioning, he stopped exploring, he grew, but only physically. Now this alternate version of him goes by the name of Ra, which is also a periodic symbol for radium. A radioactive element, unstable atoms. Everything about him shouldn't be possible, which is the irony of ironies that the impossible could kill Adam. Adam shrinks to avoid Ra's blast, but the blasts knock everyone else to the ground and Terrific gets up weakly stating that he thinks science is pathetic. Ra tells him no, not science, their hope. But it doesn't matter anymore. Everything ends. Just then, Adam tells him that he's right and grows in size, stomping on Ra. He shouldn't be able to get that big, but then again, everything is still unknown, isn't it? He'd forgotten what it was like to be in the edge of the unknown, how it felt to be so overwhelming and so unknowable. He felt so small, he forgot how exciting it is. Everything he knows about science tells him that there's no way out of this, but it turns out everything he knows about science is just a drop in the ocean now. He has no idea if the plan will work, but compared to his previous certainty that it wouldn't, well, that's an improvement. So come on, let's make some metal men. Meanwhile, over with Lois Lane and no more superheroes. How did this get worse than anything she could have possibly imagined? Just seeing her. She tells Perry and Jimmy to run, but where can anyone run to now? A world where there are no superheroes is descending upon them. And leading them is her, an evil Lois Lane. But this Lois Lane, she didn't just reject the heroes, she killed them. All Lois could do is watch in horror at what she could have become. But before she could wonder any further, Maxima grabs her stating that they need to get her out of here, now. Lois tells her they can't, they have to go to her if she did what she thinks. As Maxima lands, Lois's dark version states that they can never help themselves, but they are not talking with her around. Without another word, the dark Lois focuses her heat vision and melts Maxima's head. Maxima's body falls to the ground and dark Lois asks why would she partner with her? Thought she'd be smarter than that. But it doesn't seem that some things ever change. The dark Lois grabs her alternate by the hair, stating that the earth that she came from the superheroes were a menace, genetic abominations thinking that they were above the humans. So she wrote a series of articles about it and they spread across the world. Maxima was a Star Lab scientist, her source. They were exposing them for what they truly were. Until she gave herself powers. She then took on Superman, fighting him in the middle of Metropolis as they burned down the Daily Planet, destroying a museum full of children on a school trip. Her son John was on that trip and he was buried under the burning bricks of the planet. She survived, but John didn't. Neither did Maxima, she died in the battle. Superman went on an apology to her. His last stop was with her in an interview. He didn't know what hit him when she pulled out a parting gift made by Maxima, Amber Kryptonite. It absorbed all of Superman's powers and it killed him. And she cut off his damn head. The Dark Lois holds her counterpart up, telling her to look, this is her Earth. It is burning because of their superhero problem. And the truth is, they really are the same. And if they are, then she has at least thought of the possibility that they'd go rogue. The truth is, Lois did once too often. The dark Lois begins to fly up asking why is she so quiet? Because if she'd call for him, he'd come and save her. Go ahead, scream Superman's name and bring him right here. Lois knows that she doesn't have to scream. 
If she makes even the softest cry, he'd hear her. Calling him would be killing him, though. It killed them all. Clark has made many sacrifices in the past, so now it's her turn, her time, to bring that truth to power. No matter the risk or the cost, the dark her wanted her to scream? No, not now, not ever. Now we travel to Raven, falling through the cracks. The ground shakes as the fight goes on, and as Raven watches her team fight these monsters, she never thought that it would end like this. As it would seem that their team has won, the ground beneath them splits and everyone falls into a deep cave. And at the end, evil changes a person. Raven knows this all too well. It turns you into something unrecognizable. Everything that they are warped and twisted into a nightmare, a shattered reflection. However, it wasn't Trigon calling to her, it was her own dark version. One who had her own team, who didn't believe in justice, but in power. Each of the Teen Titans has to take on their own shadow, and the two Ravens watch. The Dark One says that she can join them. She doesn't really have a choice, actually. Soon the war will come to an end, and they will win. Raven gathers her strength, blasting her evil twin away, stating that she must not have heard her the first time. Leave my friends alone! The Shade snarls, stating that they can't fight fate. But Raven disagrees. She can and she will. She once had no one but the shadows that tried to lead her astray. Those shadows were her only companions. They told her to choose power over honor, to choose her father. But then she found her true family. The darker variant of her withstands her attacks, telling her that she is weak, that their world is dead. It is time to come back home and lead your team to their true identity. Raven says that the dark multiverse's world is dependent on one thing, that she'd ever let a shadow, a vicious whisper, find a place in her heart so she can take her team and their sick future back to hell. As Raven expels all of her power, sending her evil counterpart and team back into the hellfire, she lifts her friends out. Never did she think that it would end like this, but she always knew their light would lead the way. And while there are three more stories in the last 52, we are running short on time, my dear viewers. If you want to read the story of Penguin John Constantine's Swamp Thing, you might want to consider buying the issue yourself. But it's time that we get back to death metal to see what is going to happen with Diana and the one who laughs. Diana watches as the battle is unfolding all around her, the Bat family clashing against an army of crows led by the Robin King. Superman leads a group of his altars against the dark Superman that was lost before he reached Earth, and he now has the power of several suns. Some have already fallen. As the forces of good clash against the dark Earths, Diana lashes out, meeting the one who laughs in a battle of the gods. She knows that he is her final enemy, and she also knows that he is stronger than her. She reaches out, shrinking one of the Dark Earth, slamming it hard into his face. And he laughs, reaching down for the Teen Titans, lifting them up and throwing them across the battlefield. Diana takes precious moments to catch them. It's all her enemy needs as he slams her with enough force to knock them both through time. She slams into the ground as the dinosaurs are walking around her. She hears the voice of the one who laughs and orders the coward to show himself. Maybe if the folks respect the past this time, the big rock won't go boom. He shouts as he tackles her again. On the battlefield, Barry dodges lightning blasts from the dark Wally that never stepped off of the Mobius chair. And Arthur is squeezed by a Kraken that is controlled by his mother, who has become the Dark Queen of Atlantis. Harley and Abigail try to free Swamp Thing from a much bigger and angrier Guardian of the Green. The Bat family continues to fight against waves of crows. Tell me our shorts worth this short, Jason yells as he cuts off the head of another crow. No way! They were so much shorter, Barbara shouts to her friends. I will not die by pixie boots! I will not die by pixie boots! Dick keeps repeating as he kicks and leaps among his enemies. Batman's villains stand by his side, Joker laughing as he kills Robins, the Robin King laughing and gloating as he watches the battle. My family can do this all day, Junior! Batman snarls at him. The Supermen are continuing to fight the last son. Hit him with everything! We can destabilize his core! Clark shouts as he lashes out with Omega Beams. Diana can see all of this and shouts for her friends to keep fighting. And when she looks around, she's suddenly surrounded by nothingness. Where am I? At the beginning of it all, the one who last cackles at her, when suddenly they look up to see Perpetuous Hand of Creation. It reaches out prepared to create the world and start history towards this moment. The one who laughs looks at her and tells her that no matter what she does, she will lose. If they don't restart the universe, half of her friends will be dead and the hands of creation will return and wipe the world from existence. 
Diana looks to the future and knows that he is right. There is no winning this battle. On the battlefield, Barry is distracted by Wally. The rogues appear, pulling the former hero from his chair and stopping him. Donna, Troy, Artemis, and Hippolyta arrive to save Arthur and his family from the dark version of his mother, and Dick screams as Barbara falls. Joker laughs as he tries to push his guts back inside of a wound in his stomach. Damien fights to stand by his father as another wave of crows rush them. Father, this is it. I want to tell you something. I need you to know. I definitely would have been the best Batman. Damien whispers to his father. The crows circle them as Batman, Damien, and Nightwing fight back to back. The Supermen begin to fall, Clark rushing forward, slamming hard into the last sun, bringing him away from the battlefield and out into space. Diana and the one who laughs stand as Perpetua's hand begins to create. He tells her that she has two choices. If she continues to fight, then neither of them will be strong enough to fight the hands of creation. Or you surrender. I kill the hands and I will grant you, your friends, and everyone on Earth a restored Earth, safe and happy, he tells her. But he uses this moment of distraction to lash out at Diana. She dodges the attack, kicking the hand of Perpetua back into the one who laughs face. On Earth, Harley has fallen, and Batman's ring hand is cut off and the Black Lantern ring falls away. Clark is burning as he carries the last sun into space. Diana punches the one who lasts forward in time while this is going on. Past round tables of friends coming together, rockets bringing a young baby to Earth until they reach the fiery end of time, where all realities burn up in the ever-expanding sun that cannot be stopped. This is where you die, monster! She screams, and the one who laughs smiles. Better hurry then, because they're here. He cackles at her. Diana turns as she can see them coming, the hands of creation. The one who laughs tries to convince her one last time, just join him and he'll restore her world. It doesn't have to end this way. He whispers to her and back on earth, Batman falls to his knees, surrounded by the bodies of the crows and his family. Man, oh man, what a neat fight! The Robin King laughs. He begins to gloat. He knows that Bruce can't hold his undead body together. Not without the Black Lantern Ring. But you can rally! You're Batman after all. Say it for me. Just once in that voice. I'm Batman. He laughs. Bruce nods as he looks down at the severed stump of his arm. Sure, kid. But first, I've met a lot of me and I've got to say... You're not the brightest if you think that I would keep the real ring on my hand. Batman says to him, the bat symbol on his chest begins to glow with the light of the Black Lantern symbol as he stands. See, now I have your army and mine. So yeah, I'm Batman, but it feels better to say we're all Batman, except you, punk. He tells him as the Bat family rises, the crows alongside them, now all under control of the Lord of the Dead, Batman. Isn't that right, old friend? Batman asks as Alfred steps out of the shadows. It certainly is, sir. And let me say how much I've missed you all. Now, let's give this little brute a time out. Alfred tells him. Out in space, Clark is dying as the last sun gloats, but suddenly Lex is there in one of his suits. Clark looks up, barely conscious, as he asks Lex what he's doing. No way this universe ends without me getting to kill at least one Superman. Now go, he shouts as he knocks Clark away. He smiles at the last sun, telling him that his suit is powered by a miniature black hole. Nonsense. Such a suit would be unstable. Any real damage would cause a black hole event. Huh? I guess that's why I've never worn it before. Lex says simply, as that suit detonates and begins to suck everything into the black hole. But meanwhile, at the end of time, Diana continues to push the one who laughs into the sun as the villain screams for her to picture the perfect world that she could have had. She can see it, and she realizes it would be a world where her friends are young and happy, where this darkness never happened. She closes her eyes, and she looks at it and sees it unfold before her. She watches as she shoves the one who laughs screaming into the flames. For a long time, there's nothing. And so Diana finally opens up her eyes to the white void around her. A voice is speaking to her, a voice of creation. When they created the multiverse, their hope is that the people would ascend. But the people of her world activate the fight against this. My kind has rarely been so stunned and horrified. The voice tells her, 
So it's true? Everything is undone? Please, I must know. She whispers to the void, and the voice refuses to tell her, until they have appeared as a form that she can understand. To show you an example of a being my kind does admire, a creation that we celebrate for its heroism. In moments, Diana stands before the younger version of herself, and she is confused. The young Diana smiles as she explains that she saved them, even though it would mean the end of her being. We have never seen any other multiverse do something so foolish or admirable. Such, you have caused us to rethink our methods. The young Diana explains. The hand tells her that her multiverse will be restored. All history and stories will be remembered and set once and for all. That there will be no more walls or boundaries in their reality. And so there will be greater threats but greater possibilities, the young Diana says. Diana nods and promises that they will make the hands proud, but young Diana smiles and tells her, there will be a cost. If my life is a part of that cost, I will gladly give it, she says simply. But young Diana takes her hand and begins to lead her through the void, telling her, let us greet the future and let the truth be the metal that cuts our path always. The world has been restored. Superman gathered the heroes at the steps of the Hall of Justice, and he thanked everyone that fought in the battle, heroes, villains, and citizens alike. A great party is being thrown for everyone, for they have survived and the world is going on. But eventually, Barry took Wally away from the party, and he brought him into space. He should give him a new base of operations. The totality. Something new. Think of it as a shield protecting the world from future threats, manned by the greatest minds, villains, and heroes together. The next stage of the Halls of Justice and Doom. Barry explains as he introduces Wally to the new team. Wally is shocked. The group explains that the multiverse has been restored with a myriad of new futures opening up every moment, but Lex explains that whole multiverses are being created, forming an omniverse, an infinite frontier. It is Mr. Terrific that explains that their Earth is no longer the center of the multiverse either. There are two others. Martian Manhunter explains that at least one of them is an Earth, and they are calling it Elseworld. And there you have it, the story of Death Metal, which led into Future State, which led into Infinite Frontier, which is the storyline we are doing right now over at DC Comics. What did you think about this? My personal opinion, I liked DC Dark Knight's Metal, the first one, better. This one just kind of felt like a crazy all over the place storyline, but it still came to a great finale in my opinion. But let me know in the comments down below what you think about this. And don't forget to stick around as every Monday we bring you a full story right here at the Comic Story and Channel.